a pill that induces abortions in women up to nine weeks pregnant. The hearing was prompted by several reports of deaths that may have been caused by the pill. It's about three hours. Subcommittee will come to order. I think that's better for sound. We are here today because there is a drug on the market associated with the deaths of at least eight women, nine life-threatening incidents, 232 hospitalizations, 116 blood transfusions, and 88 cases of infection. There have been more than 950 adverse event cases associated with RU486 out of only 575,000 prescriptions at most. Adverse events are typically underreported since they are offered voluntarily by consumers and healthcare professionals, so it is most likely that there are many more cases that we don't even know about. It is very clear that there is a serious problem with RU486. In failing to address this problem by disguising it, ignoring it, minimizing it, or causing confusion is a shameful failure for anyone with the ability and desire to protect women from needless harm. RU486 is a common name for Mifeprex. It is produced by Danco Laboratories, a corporate entity located in the Cayman Islands, which produces only that single drug and nothing else. Mifeprex is approved by the FDA for the termination of pregnancy through 49 days of development. It is used in combination with another drug called Mysoprostol, which causes uterine contractions that expel the dead fetus. fetus. This is an off-label use for the mysoprostol, which contains a black box warning against using the drug during pregnancy. At least five of the deaths following the use of RU486 have been the result of toxic shock-like syndrome initiated by bacteria Clostridium sordell, sordelli. This bacteria is thought to exist in low numbers in the reproductive tracts of many women and is normally combated by the immune system. Experts in immunology, pharmacology, and maternal fetal medicine have suggested that because RU46 interferes with the innate immune response, the bacteria, if present, is allowed to flourish, causing a widespread multi-organ infection in the woman. These infections are not accompanied by a fever, and the symptoms match those that are expected after taking the RU46 regimen, including cramping, pain, bleeding, nausea, vomiting. Each of the women infected with C. sordelli after taking RU46 were dead within five to seven days. To investigate the nature of this bacteria, the CDC and FDA held a scientific workshop last week called Emerging Quest Stradiol disease. The workshop panelists noted that the rapid growth of the C. sordelli bacteria in the RU46 context likely forecloses effective treatment and that there is no currently identifiable window of opportunity for treatment once a woman is infected, even with major interventions such as a hysterectomy. The fatality rate has been 100 percent for the women who have contracted C. sordelli infection after using RU486. Any other drug associated with a 100% fatal septic infection that kills otherwise healthy adults within days with no apparent window for treatment and associated with an exponential amount of severe reactions would normally prompt an immediate withdrawal. But we are talking about a drug regimen that is administered to cause an abortion manufactured by a drug company based in the Cayman Islands with no other drugs on the market and therefore no incentive to voluntarily withdraw its product no matter how dangerous. Many abortion advocates feel they have to defend RU486 because it is an alternative to surgical abortion. However, with the eight deaths that we know about, RU486 is 10 to 14 times more likely to be fatal than surgical abortion during the first seven weeks of pregnancy, the period during which the drug is administered. To continue defending this dangerous drug in light of the mounting scientific evidence, injury and death is to allow one's zeal for abortion to truly distort their view about what's right for the women's health. The 10 times more deadly danger posed by RU46 should not be considered an acceptable risk that justified keeping this drug on the market. 
The approval of RU-46 was made under extreme political pressure from the Clinton administration, which is well documented in a recent report by Judicial Watch entitled The Clinton RU-46 Files. I ask that this report be included in the hearing record. RU-46 was forced through the FDA using an extraordinary provision called Subpart H, reserved only for drugs that treat life-threatening illnesses and for which existing treatments are insufficient. It was obvious even to the drug sponsor that RU-46 did not fall within the narrow scope of Subpart H, saying the FDA's imposition of Subpart H was unlawful, unnecessary, and undesirable. But that did not ter deter the FDA in its extraordinary political complicity with the print President Clinton's administration from forcing an abortion pill onto the market, no matter how distorted the approval process was or what the price. We are, praying that we are paying that price now. Almost 1,000 women have suffered adverse effects after taking RU-46. We know that eight have died. We have a responsibility to consider the dangers that this drug poses and question whether the FDA has the authority to remove it from the market in the light of the severe problems associated with this drug and the manufacturer's failure to comply with post-marketing restrictions. I anticipate that the defenders of RU-486 will try to detract from the cold hard facts or cause confusion by talking about other septic infections in other pregnancy situations. This tactic ignores what the panelists reported at last week's CDC conference that Mifeprex comprises the innate human syst immune system, providing an environment for rapid growth of the deadly infection. C. Cerdelli infection in the RU-46 context is 100 percent fatal with no opportunity for intervention. To ignore the immune system connection with Mifeprex or to say that there have been only five such deaths and advocate I don't have the last page and advocate for for better surveillance and informed consent will be no comfort to the family of the next woman who dies suddenly after taking RU-486. To the shallow objection that those of us who are pro-life have no business looking into the problems associated with RU-486, let me respond that this is a smokescreen and is incredibly shameful. Anyone who honestly cares about women's health has to take a critical look at the potential dangers of this drug. To argue otherwise on the basis that it is simply an abortion issue is to demonstrate a blind allegiance to abortion at any cost, including women's lives. Representing the FDA on the first panel is Dr. Janet Woodcock, Deputy Commissioner for Operations. On our second panel, we'll hear from Monty Patterson, the father of Holly Patterson, who was 18 years old when she died after taking RU-46, Dr. Susan Wood, former FDA Assistant Commissioner for Women's Health, Dr. Lisa Rarick of RAR Consulting, Dr. Donna Harrison, a member of the Mifeprex Subcommittee on the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and Carter Sneed, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame and former General Counsel for the President's Council on Bioethics. I wish to note that the Medical Director for Danco, the Cayman Islands-based manufacturer for RU-46, initially agreed to testify at this hearing, but pulled out two days ago. I intend to follow up with Danco to request answers in a sworn affidavit to critical questions re regarding Danco's failure to comply with the post-marketing restrictions for RU-46. Last of all, I want to note that I notified the FDA last December that this subcommittee would conduct a hearing into RU-46. FDA's compliance with this oversight committee's document request has been quite frustrating. We were getting critical documents related to our December request as late as last night. This hearing is not the end of our document request, and I invite better cooperation from the agency moving forward. Now that we are here and that we have most of the documents we requested five months ago, it's time to seek some answers about what can be done to protect women from this deadly drug. Now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. I want to join you in welcoming all of our witnesses testifying this afternoon on a very important subject, protecting women's health. In particular, I want to acknowledge Mr. Marty Patterson, who lost his 18-year-old daughter, Holly, when she died as a result of, the, of a rare bacterial infection. I offer my sincere condolences to the Patterson family and want to commend Mr. Patterson and his family for their efforts to become well-versed in this subject area in the wake of a terrible family tragedy. As you know, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, C. sedelii is a bacterium that normally resides in soil. Although cases of human illness are rare, the effect is usually fatal 
when the bacteria produces toxins that cause rapid onset of shock that physicians are powerless to curtail. To date, medical literature reflects a total, a total of approximately 30 reported fatalities from C. sedelii infection. Cases of infection have involved both males and females of all ages. At least eight of the reported fatalities occurred in women who had just given birth and two occurred after miscarriages. The selective focus of today's hearing centers on five fatal cases that have occurred over the past five years and also involve pregnancy. Four of these cases occurred in California, the other in Canada. The key factor linking this small subset of cases is that they occurred in women who underwent medical abortion. Last week, the Centers for Disease Control, as you said, convened a scientific meeting on C. sedelii and another related bacterium. The meeting served to underscore just how little is known about the cause of human C. sedelii infections. Although a number of theories were advanced and debated, the meeting produced no solid answers as to how the infection is acquired. The only consensus was that much more needs to be learned if additional deaths are to be prevented. Despite the overwhelming scientific uncertainty among experts, a number of policymakers and policy shapers apparently have already arrived at the conclusion that the drug mefeprestone, mef mef also known as RU486, and marketed in the United States under the name Mephiprex is the likely cause of the infection in the five cases involving patients who underwent medical abortion. Consequently, they are advocating the FDA's immediate withdrawal of Mephiprex from the market. What is the basis for this belief? Is it science or is it something else? It's difficult to overlook the fact that adherence to this point of view generally opposed the introduction of mefeprestone into the United States in the first place, or to ignore the fact that they did so on an ideological grounds, knowing that there had been no reported fatalities among as many as two million users of the drug in Europe. To bolster their argument, proponents of withdrawing FDA approval suggest that the FDA, in effect, rushed the drug to market. But the record shows that the approval process was thorough and unusually lengthy. However, it resulted in more stringent restrictions on distribution than applied to most other drugs. Mr. Chairman, I hope it is fair and correct to presume that not one participant in today's hearing takes the health of women lightly. As a matter of fact, every single one of us take women's health very seriously. My own concern for both women's health and women's rights leads me to wonder, however, why the narrow focus on these cases and on this drug as the suspected culprit? Why not concern ourselves with all the possible causes of infection in not only these five cases, but also the other nine or ten reported cases in which pregnancy was the common denominator. If ensuring a high standard of health care for American women is our pure objective, it just seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that our focus should be seeking the truth concerning the cause of C. sedelii infection rather than attempting to bully the FDA into taking action unsupported by science that would have just one certain impact, limiting access to abortion for many, many women. Therefore, I hope today's hearing can serve the purpose of promoting thorough scientific inquiry and supporting a research agenda that will lead us to answers that can prevent infection and the death from infection. Concentrating on five cases involving medical abortion, 
to the exclusion of a larger number of equally tragic cases appears to serve the narrow purpose of whittling away at a woman's constitutional right to choose by limiting practical access to abortion. I only, only hope that in this case, appearances are deceiving. I look forward to the testimony and I thank them for being with us. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Now I yield to other members wishing to opening statements. Mr. Waxman, do you have an opening statement? I, I'm going to ask, um, okay. let, me, let me ask this process and then he'll, that, uh, it's been a practice if members are f members of the full committee but not the subcommittee that we've let them participate and I ask and ask consent that Mr. Shays be allowed to participate but he'll go to the back of the rest of everybody else's opening statements. Okay. Yield to Mr. Waxman. Well, well thank you very much uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this uh, chance to make an opening statement and to attend this hearing because, because this is an important hearing. Uh, the um, gives us a chance to talk about the deaths of several women who had taken mipristone, uh, mi, uh, RU486, we've all been stumbling over that word, which is the medical abortion pill. These deaths were tragic and I also want to join in extending my deep sympathies to the uh, Patterson family who lost their daughter and thank you uh, for coming today. We're going to discuss these cases as part of a broader pattern of C. sodelii infection. This is an infection that has killed men, men, women, and children. It's killed women who have just given birth, women who had miscarriages, and a woman who had not even been pregnant. And with, and with any infection we do not yet understand well, we need better research and surveillance to fight it. But before we begin this discussion, I'd like to say something about another reason I believe we are here. There are people who have wanted RU486 to be pulled off the market since the day it was approved. In fact, they didn't want it to be approved. And I respect their judgment because they're very strongly against an abortion, whether it be by RU486 or by a, a medical procedure. But that is not the issue of safety, and it's not an issue of science, and it's not an issue of data. That makes it an ideological opposition to a woman's right to choose abortion. And in fact, many of those who want to take this drug off the market want women to have virtually zero access to any kind of abortion, whether it be medical or surgical. I, I need not remind people what happened before abortion became legal and safe in the United States. Hundreds of thousands of women per year sought out illegal abortions or tried to induce abortions themselves. Tens of thousands suffered major infections and other injuries. And even after the introduction of antibiotics, hundreds of women died every year before abortion was made legal and safe. There are many who want us to have uh, states' rights to pass the kind of law that was just adopted in South Dakota to ban all abortions, even in the case of rape or incest, in order to preserve the or, or even to preserve the health and well-being of the mother. That's the ultimate expression of their point of view, but it's not the point of view I, I share, and it's not the point of view that I think most people uh, would share. This drug, uh, is, which is the subject of today's hearing, has some promising characteristics. It offers women an alternative to surgery for early termination of pregnancy. It's available to many who, women who do not have access to surgical abortions, and it's been widely and safely used in Europe. On the other hand, questions have been raised about whether there may be a link between the drug and the tragic deaths of several young women. That's the question. Is there a link between this drug and those deaths? And that is a scientific issue, not an ideological one. And it's an issue that we ought to leave to the Food and Drug Administration scientists to look at the evidence. Now, that it has been asserted by the chairman that uh, the, cause, the, uh, the, the side effects may be uh, uh, understated because there's voluntary disclosure. Well, that's true of all drugs. There's voluntary disclosure of adverse events, but not this drug. Because the drug, which had a lengthy period of time by which it was under surveillance at the Food and Drug Administration, was approved ultimately under subpart H which put a lot of restrictions in place in the use of this drug, 
which are not in place for the use of other drugs that are available on the market today in the United States. And one of the limits it, to its use was that a physician had to agree in advance to report any uh, adverse use of this, uh, consequences from use of this drug uh, to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer is obligated under law to report it to the FDA. So we have a pretty clear picture of, of what has been going on. This is not like the Plan B drug which has not been approved by the FDA for over-the-counter use because of political pressure on the FDA. This drug was not approved by political pressure. It was approved under the usual standards of safety and efficacy. Now, other drugs have been approved under that stat status and, uh, and have been taken off when we saw that there were uh, consequences to it which changed the balance of whether it was a safe and efficacious drug. And that is the issue of whether this drug should remain available to women. It should be resolved based on scientific assessment of its benefits and dangers. If the best scientific evidence turns out to demonstrate that the risks do in fact outweigh the benefits, then FDA should make a decision accordingly. But it should be kept on the market or removed using the same legal and scientific standards that are used for all other drugs. For today, let's take a close and serious look at C. cerdelii infection. We must encourage our scientists to figure out why these women and the other victims of this bacteria, which had no relationship that we know of to um, RU486, why they died. And we should do everything we can to improve detection and treatment. But in the end, we need to make sure any regulatory decision about 4 r U486 is based on the science and the law and not the politics of the abortion debate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Holmes Norton, do you have an opening statement? Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Uh, first, I want to say uh, that if there is a drug, if it's a contraceptive a drug, if it's a drug uh, related in any way uh, to uh, the health of women that scientists tell us causes death or injury of any kind, uh, that drug uh, should have no approval. I don't think this committee uh, is qualified to make that judgment. I think that judgment has to be committed uh, to the kind of scientific study you would do if you were are serious about these eight deaths. The most important thing we can do is to find out causation here because then we know uh, how to prevent the deaths or injury. And anything that stands in the way of that link uh, it is it, it not a serious attempt to deal with it. Anything that jumps over the appropriate scientific inquiry is not serious about these eight deaths. Uh, because uh, I think RU486 has been very important in preventing abortions, uh, in, 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 in getting to where American women are going to get anywhere, anyway, you simply will never be able to keep uh, this kind of, of uh, drug which has not been shown to be harmful by scientists out of the hands of people. So if it's going to get into the hands of people, one thing we want to know is what causes it. Um, what we don't want um, is to <laughs> investigate scientists, for example, who give us answers contrary to our personal or moral or religious beliefs. We want to leave them free and unfettered uh, to tell us what the scientific method reveals uh, to them. 
finally, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm, I particularly regret not being able to stay throughout this hearing because of other hearings, but I do want to go on the record indicating um, the um, unthinkable series of of um, series we have witnessed during this term that show the unmitigated politicization of the one area that Americans always held off from politics, and that is science itself. Whether Schiavo or creationism, uh, or renamed intelligent design, or stem cell research, or God help us, global warming itself. Uh, there are views floating around this Congress that essentially reach conclusions on these matters of huge scientific moment based on their own personal beliefs. Uh, I never thought that the country that has stood at the forefront of science in the world would ever be reduced, would ever reduce science to personal uh, and political uh, and religious views and opinions, and uh, I don't believe that in, in, in effect that is what the country is going to let us do when they see the long list uh, before them of bills, of things we now can't do, of things we do do, only because of the personal, political, and religious views of some members. And when they see that the attempts that have been made during this session of Congress and during this administration uh, to burden scientists with the personal views of members of Congress, it is a, a shameful day for American science, and I think we're going to we, we have to wipe it away if we do nothing else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I shall be brief. Uh, let me just thank you for calling this hearing. And I think that every single one of us are indeed concerned about the health, safety, and well-being of every single individual as they make use of a drug, medical procedure, or pattern of treatment, pattern of treatment. I would hope, especially given the fact that we're talking about safety of a drug, that we discuss and debate the science and not the ideological expressions of individuals who may be bent one way or another around the question and the issue of abortion. And so I look forward to the witnesses and look forward to the information that's going to be presented, and I yield back. Mr. Rupertsburg. Got it. Okay, can you hear it now? Okay. Uh, starting again, we know the abortion issue is, is a very difficult issue, and we also know that, the, that individuals, no matter which side of the issue you are on with respect to abortion, is something that you're probably not going to change. And it would be uh, p more positive for our whole country if we could come to some resolution, but I don't think that's going to happen. But I think in today's hearing it's important that we really don't use the political issue of abortion, but focus on this RU486. Now, with that in mind, RU486 RU underwent a vigorous, a rigorous four-year review process F at the FDA, more rig rigorous than most drugs. As you know, it was considered under a select set of regulations called Subpart H, which allowed the FDA to add more conditions on the drug's distribution and use. Since its approval in 2000, year 2000, 
Nearly 600,000 women in the U.S. have used RU486. It has proven to be a safe and effective means of terminating early pregnancy. Because of this medical option, millions of women worldwide, including survivors of sexual assault, have had the right to end an early pregnancy with privacy and dignity. Tragically, there have been four confirmed deaths in the U.S. from bacterial infection in women who use RU486. At this point, we do not know what caused these infections or if these deaths are at all related to the use of RU486. Fortunately, the CDC and FDA have moved quickly to investigate these incidents. Early this month, a 486 uh, scientist from the nation's leading public health agencies gathered in Atlanta to discuss the bacteria that caused these deaths and the risk it poses to pregnant women. Career scientists and doctors are the best equipped to investigate this issue, and I know they will get to the bottom of it. We must rely on accepted medical standards for determining the safety and efficacy of a medication. The future of RU486 should lie with the FDA and the medical community, not with Congress, who do not have yet the full picture and have the scientific data before us to make a decision on women's health. I yield back. Uh, Ms. Watson. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I applaud the subcommittee for bringing this topic up to educate the American public. It's very important that the FDA, our drug watchdog agency, is engaged with the scientific community and the population at large in order to provide informed choices uh, for the women of the United States. My for Press Stone R, RU486, has been utilized for nearly two decades by women all over the globe. This drug provides an early abortion option that does not require surgery. It's been reported that since the FDA approved uh, RU-487 in 2000, significantly more than half a million American women have used this medication. Mr. Chairman, let's be very clear during this hearing today. Ideological debate, pro or anti-abortion is a discussion that we have been afforded the free speech right to talk about. Medical process and drug effectiveness should not be subject to any debate of that style. It is imperative to the health of our nation that Congress, the FDA, healthcare delivery professionals, and the scientific community and patients approach the utilization of any drug from an educated, scientifically tested and unbiased perspective. So I'm interested to hear the testimony of our witnesses because oversight is a serious responsibility that we undertake on behalf of the American people. And the use of RU486 is a subject that must be treated with unbiased integrity and regard for the overall health of women. Four women have died of sepsis. All four were infected by the same type of bacteria. What does the medical and scientific community say to this situation? Is Mufferprex responsible? So our decision should be based on education and scientific investigation, and I look forward to uh, hearing uh, about that information, and I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you, uh, one, for having a hearing on this issue, uh, to encourage you to use that same logic to have a hearing on uh, Plan B, uh, which is a related drug uh, that doesn't require an abortion but can accomplish the same task. I um, want to say that I have extraordinary respect for you, and in spite of your, your bias one way and my bias the other, I'm convinced that this will be a fair hearing, and I uh, appreciate that. And I guess I would just end by saying that um, I, I appreciate particularly the thoughtful statement of your ranking member, Mr. Cummings, and the ranking member of the full committee. I think others have said the same thing, but I think they covered it well. And if I could have written a statement in time, I would have been pleased to have written either of those two statements. So I would like to stand on their statements. And again, thank you for allowing me to participate. 
Thank you, and the record needs to show that there have been eight women at least who've died, 950 adverse events, and uh, not all are necessarily associated with the other infection. Also, um, I, I would like to ban abortion, but this isn't about abortion. We can't ban abortion. This is a, a, a health question, and just because scientists disagree doesn't mean that one person is trying to put an ideological view on and other people have a scientific view. And in a number of, of issues lately, I have been accused of being anti-science because the scientists I support disagree with the scientists who another group support. In fact, this drug was cleared in an expedited process, not using mostly U.S. Uh, uh, research, and we have a right to look into this drug, and we should be looking into this drug. Scientists disagree, and we should hear the debate. Just because one group of scientists is political, um, and it doesn't mean that the other group of scientists aren't political too. We all know that science requires judgments as well. If it was just an ideological view, we couldn't hold this hearing. We're not hearing from ideological people, we're hearing from medical people, we're hearing from researchers, and we will hear the debate, and I'm looking forward to that debate. I ask and ask consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record, that any answers to written questions provided by the witness also be included for the record. Without objection, it's so ordered. I also ask and ask consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by members and the witnesses may be included in the hearing record, that all members be permitted to revise and extend the remarks, and without objection, it's so ordered. Our first panel is composed of Janet Woodcock, uh, Dr. Woodcock, a Deputy Commissioner for Operations at the FDA. If you could come forward, remain standing. Uh, if you, that it is the, uh, as the Oversight Committee, it's our standard procedure to swear in our witnesses. If you'll raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today is the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Let the record show that the witness uh, responded in the uh, affirmative. We thank you for coming today, and we're looking forward to your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Cummings, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Janet Woodcock, Deputy Commissioner for Operations at the Food and Drug Administration. Today, I will discuss the approval history and the current regulatory status of the product Mifepristone, currently marketed in the U.S. under the trade name Mifeprex and indicated for termination of early pregnancy. First, I would like to correct any misconceptions that may exist about the initial approval of the drug. Mifeprex was approved in September 2000 after extensive FDA review of the application, which included three adequate and well-controlled trials documenting the efficacy and safety profile of the drug when used for this indication. In addition, post-market experience in Europe included over 620,000 exposures for pregnancy termination, of which 415,000 were in combination with misoprostol. These data fully conformed with FDA standards for approval. In order to assure that Mifeprex was used by qualified specialists, FDA and the sponsor agreed that the drug would be approved under 21 CFR 314.520. This section of subpart H concerns safety, not effectiveness. This infrequently used regulatory provision allows approval of a drug with restrictions to assure safe use. In this case, distribution of Mifeprex is restricted to physicians qualified to supervise medical abortion and its complications, and who have agreed to fully inform patients and obtain their written agreement to provide an FDA-approved patient information sheet and agreed to report serious adverse events to the sponsor. This product met the requirements of all applicable laws and regulations, including subpart H. As FDA made clear in the preamble to the final rule, the subpart H regulations were intended to apply to serious or life-threatening conditions, such as depression, not only to diseases. Approval of Mifeprix under restricted distribution had nothing to do with accelerated approval based on a surrogate endpoint, which is a separate provision of the regulations. FDA has monitored reports of Mifeprex-related adverse events very carefully after marketing. As of March 31, 2006, 950 cases related to the approved use were submitted to FDA. Consistent with the clinical trials experience and the drug label, heavy vaginal bleeding was the most frequently reported adverse event, with 422 cases, followed by incomplete abortion 
with approximately 400 cases. Other serious events included 88 instances of infection, with 18 of them considered severe, and 27 ectopic pregnancies. This adverse event profile was consistent with prior experience with medical termination of pregnancy. Since approval, FDA has evaluated nine reports of deaths in the U.S. potentially associated with the approved indication. Three of these have either been found or appear to be unrelated to medical abortion. An additional death was due to a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. The use of Mifeprex is contraindicated in ectopic pregnancy. Five deaths were due to a rapidly fatal toxin-mediated shock syndrome. One of these was caused by infection with Clostridium perfringens. The four additional deaths, all in California, were caused by infection with a rare anaerobic bacterium, Clostridium sordellii. An additional Clostridium sordellii fatality previously occurred in a clinical trial in Canada. This rapidly fatal toxin-mediated shock syndrome was not anticipated to be a complication of medical abortion. It has not been reported in the extensive European experience to date, estimated over 1.5 million uses of the drug. Eight previous U.S. cases of fatal shock due to C. sordelli, primarily after vaginal uh, delivery or cesarean delivery, have been reported in the obstetrical literature. FDA responded aggressively to the reports with extensive follow-up and expert consultation. Last week, NIH, CDC, and FDA co-sponsored a scientific workshop on potential emerging clostridium infections. CDC researchers identified three additional sordellii cases, two fatal, that occurred after spontaneous abortion. CDC has also instituted an investigation in California looking into 321 unexplained pregnancy-associated deaths between 2000 and 2003. They have excluded 303 cases from being related to toxic uh, shock-related syndrome and are further investigating 18. Given that the information on this infection and its epidemiology is still emerging, it is not possible at this time to determine whether the current mifepristone misoprostol regimen for medical abortion results in an increased risk of C. sordelli infection or whether the reporting requirements under the mifeprex approval and subsequent intensive investigations have uncovered what is an emerging risk in pregnancy overall. FDA is collaborating with the CDC and NIH on further research into this infection and will continue to provide timely public information. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Let me ask this uh, first question as a, a multi-part. Um, this drug went through a, a different type of approval process, another subpart H in the approval process, and it allows the FDA to impose certain restrictions on the distribution Mifeprex, which you covered in your written testimony. How do you monitor uh, Danco's compliance with each of these restrictions, and what do you do when they're not in compliance? And furthermore, are they absolutely required to report all the um, incidents? Yes, FDA has, uh, once the drug was approved under these provisions, put into place inspectional uh, system to, for FDA to inspect the manufacturer <coughs> to assure they were pr pr uh, pr complying with the provisions of the approval. And we have done frequent inspections uh, to oversee their compliance uh, with this program. And are they required under the law to report all adverse effects? All ma manufacturers, all manufacturers are re required under the law to report adverse events that they find out about with drugs that they manufacture or distribute to the FDA. Um, are you tracking that? Yes. And then if you are, how did, did the manufacturer not know about some of the things that you referred to? Or did you discover, did you discover those through the manufacturer? Have they reported any of these? Uh, do you the view vast, them as cooperative? The vast majority of reports that we have received, which are over a thousand, counting duplicates, have come directly from the manufacturer. The um, physicians who have signed the physician agreement are instructed to report adverse events to the manufacturer. 
that uh, we heard in a number of the opening statements referred to that there is a regimen uh, that, uh, but it, yet uh, RU-486 is frequently used past the 49 days as it's recommended and it's administered at a dosage of 200 rather than the FDA approved 600 mega uh, 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 dosage. It's often prescribed without required patient agreement form and its counterpart metoprosol is used vaginally despite its approval for oral use only. Furthermore, although the manufacturer is required to, to the ability to track its use to the patient level, the manufacturer estimates to arrive at usage rates for the purpose of uh, safety and promotional material. Now, WHO, Planned Parenthood, and a number of these are not following your regimen. Would it be fair for one to conclude from this evidence that RU-46 is not being used according to the restriction which you opposed on it uh, in subpart H? No restriction in the approval le letter or in the physician agreement that directs that says the physician must use a specified dose or regimen. The manufacturer who FDA regulates is complying with the uh, restrictions that were placed on the uh, drug distribution at the time of approval. So you're saying that individuals are. Um, let me ask us this. Would, would it be fair for one to conclude that the restrictions placed on RU-46 have failed to ensure that the drug will be used in a matter consistent with the FDA's opinion on safe use? In other words, when you cleared the drug, it was cleared on the basis of a usage. Now what you're telling me is there's no checking to see that it's being used in the way you approved it, and could not that explain some of the problem? The um, Restrict, restriction program was put in place to ensure that physicians who uh, prescribe the drug could date a pregnancy, that's a very important aspect of using this regimen, could rule out uh, with professional uh, experience an ectopic pregnancy and were able to manage the complications of medical abortion, which include requirements for surgical intervention. So that was the purpose of the restriction program. FDA reviews data that is submitted to it when FDA approves a dose and regimen in an approved indication for use of the drug. Subsequently, based on the medical literature, uh, physicians may deviate from uh, the recommended dose, and this occurs very frequently. Um, the, the restricted distribution program had to do with distribution to physicians who were qualified. So the drug is not available in pharmacies. It cannot be prescribed by physicians who are not qualified and have not gone through the, the program. So let me see if I can understand, see if this is an oversimplification of what you just said. You said you tested it with one regimen. Then you didn't put that in force because you concluded after the tests, based on information, that that regimen wasn't essential to the safety of the individuals. FDA because the, because the regimen dealt with other subjects other than the safety. FDA uh, reviewed the data based on the safety and effectiveness information that was included in the application. And that was the recommended regimen, the approved regimen that is in the drug label. The patient agreement, uh, and, and so forth discuss the, that regimen. All the approved patient labeling discusses that regimen. It is quite common in the U.S., however, um, a recent article showed that about 21 percent of uh, drug usage in the United States it deviates somewhat from the label directions. This but the, but let me, because my, my time's up, I, when I came as a freshman, I was vice chair of, of Mr. Shea's uh, subcommittee, and I remember on the secondary use of drugs, one of the huge questions is, is the FDA, however, does not give its blessing to non-approved uh, regimens and, and non-prescribed ways of, of doing it. And I would also like to insert in the record at this point uh, a history of other drugs where with uh, one or two deaths they've been pulled off the market. Usually scientific research does not go forth while there's a question on a drug, and I think an exception has been made in this for political reasons. It's exactly the reverse of what's been charged. Yield to Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, thank you for being with us, Dr. Woodstock. Dr. Woodstock, there have been allegations that uh, there was something unusual about the approval of uh, Mifeprex. Um, you were the director of the Center for Drug uh, Evaluation Research back then. Is that is that not correct? And did 
the FDA treat Mifeprex uh, using the appropriate scientific and legal standards for safety and efficacy? We use the scientific and legal standards that we use for every drug that we evaluate. Now, anti-choice advocates have criticized uh, the approval on a number of grounds, including the fact that there was no double-blind placebo controlled study of this drug. But it's hard for me to imagine how someone could conduct a placebo controlled study of an abortion drug. Would, that would mean that giving the woman, women seeking an abortion a placebo that would not terminate the pregnancy. Is that right? I suppose. The um, need for placebo it occurs when there is a tremendous variability in the outcome. And so you can't tell whether the outcome was due to the intervention <laughs> or other events. For many types of interventions, such as anesthesia, all right, we don't have a uh, randomized control group because you can easily tell whether people are unconscious and they don't become unconscious spontaneously very often. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for, for contraceptives where we have a very good background rate mm -hmm. of um, pregnancy with unprotected uh, intercourse. Mm -hmm. So in, in various situations, uh, there a totally adequate control is what is called a historical control, uh -huh. where, where we know what happens in that situation without an intervention. There seems to be confusion about the way that Mifeprex was approved. It was approved under provisions known as subpart H. Is that correct? Yes. Some of these provisions provide for an accelerated approval of drugs for life-threatening conditions but a different part of subpart H guides not expedited approval, but the restricted distribution of certain products. Why was subpart H used in the case of Mephiprex? For Mephiprex, it was felt important that the distribution be limited to qualified practitioners. Because although the intervention was found to be safe and effective, it was in the hands of individuals in the clinical trials who were able to diagnose pregnancy and date it properly, who were able to rule out ectopic pregnancy with a high degree of accuracy, and who were able to deal with the complications of medical abortion, including um, incomplete abortion. And the drug would not be safe in the hands of practitioners who did not routinely take care of pregnant women, for example. Uh -huh. So that's why these restrictions were put into place. So this wasn't had nothing to do with accelerating approval? Nothing to do with it. The um, evidence on effectiveness uh, for Mifeprex was submitted in three trials that FDA found to be adequate and well-controlled trials for the purpose of demonstrating a termination of pregnancy. Well, the, the marketing application was submitted in March of 1996, is that correct? Yes. But the drug wasn't approved until September of 2000. It's like four and a half years later. The average time for approval is about 18 months, is that correct? Yes. So why did the approval t uh, process take so long? Well, FDA had asked many questions and subjected this uh, application, everything from the manufacturing of the drug, the pharmacology, the uh, distribution of the drug, and the safety and efficacy to uh, a very thorough review, such as we would for any drug. And in this case, it took that long. What's the, I mean, I mean, is that, I mean, what's the record, uh, do you know? Length of time? Longer. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, I see my time is about up, uh, so I will, I'll submit. Uh, Let me ask uh, uh, Congresswoman Smith and Congressman Chase, did you want to ask questions of this witness? Um, that, uh, do you have questions as well, Mr. Chase? I don't. I don't want to ask her to have to stay after an hour of hearings, uh, you know, after our yep, votes. Yeah, so. we're going to have about an hour worth of votes. So, Ms. Schmidt, why don't you ask uh, some of your questions here, and, and will you answer any written questions that we give you from the different members? Certainly. Because it's going to be a long voting stretch, probably at least an hour here. Sure. Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What I'm not understanding in all of this process is that, is that there are seven deaths recorded from this drug. As a woman, why aren't we pulling this drug from the market? 
You have to distinguish, first of all, and, and I know it's very confusing, you have to distinguish reports to the FDA, uh, deaths that are actually occurred or related to administration of a drug in some way, and, one where the, and also then where there's a causal uh, relationship between administration of the drug and the death. FDA actually has nine reports of death related to medical abortion in the U.S. Three of those we find unrelated to administration of the drug. In one case, we cannot, we, either the patient is not documented to have taken the drug or other reasons unrelated. One death was due to a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Ruptured ectopic pregnancy, if the patient doesn't seek uh, medical care rapidly, can be fatal. The, it, the ruptured ectopic pregnancy, the ectopic pregnancy itself was a pre-existing condition, was not caused by administration of mifepristone and, and, and misoprostol. There were five deaths were due to, to sepsis, to infection. And what we don't know is whether or not medical abortion increases the probability of getting this infection. This infection has occurred after vaginal delivery, after cesarean section, and after a spontaneous abortion or so-called miscarriage. And there are documented cases in each of those instances. So we do not know if in medical abortion there is an increased rate of this infection or whether or not we're simply seeing these because of our intense scrutiny of outcomes after medical abortion due to the restricted distribution. May I have a follow-up, sir? Um, I I'm having a problem with your explanation, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the atopic pregnancy, the drug should never have been administered if she had an atopic pregnancy, period, case closed. I don't care what the reason why the drug was administered. It was administered wrongly that woman died because of it so there's a problem but more importantly the five of the of the infection uh, just because you don't know how the infection occurred we do know they took the drug and they died to me I'm from a farm community sounds to me like you need to pull the drug until you can be absolutely sure that there are no deaths related I've got a whole list here of drugs that have been pulled from the market either voluntarily or involuntarily there's just been a contact solution that's been pulled from the market because of serious eye affection including uh, the loss of sight uh, so we're real careful about other things about our body but when it comes to a woman's body I I'm just finding a problem that we're just not that careful uh, I think this drug needs to be pulled from the market it needs to be pulled from the market now uh, and, and it's time that the FDA does something about it. Thank you. We'll send you some additional questions. May I ask you quickly, the FDA reported 116 cases of uh, blood transfusion. Uh, do, do you believe this was caused, um, Mifoflex caused these hemorrhage cases? The um, hemorrhage is a common complication of childbirth, spontaneous abortion, surgical abortion, and medical abortion. So when a woman is pregnant, she faces a possibility of experiencing hemorrhaging after, after childbirth uh, and so forth. Yes, we expect... So you believe these were common hemorrhaging cases, not extraordinary hemorrhaging cases? It was expected and was observed in the clinical trial. There was a case of trans needing transfusion. So it was expected that some women after the medical abortion regimen would uh, have bleeding requiring transfusion. That is correct. So you, you believe that 116 cases and 575,000 is roughly similar to the population that would normally have it? Yes, and uh, we feel that all the side effects except the sordelli are within what we would expect in this population. Thank you. We'll have Mr. some Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Mr. If, if I could uh, submit questions in writing, because I do have questions. I just don't want to hold her for an hour. Okay. So I will have questions. I'll submit them through you. To Thank you. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, subcommittee stands uh, recessed until we get back from votes.
back in session. If the second panel could come forward. Second panel is Monty Patterson, father of Holly Patterson, who was 18 years old when she died taking RU46. Uh, Dr. Susan Wood, former FDA Assistant Commissioner for Women's Health. Dr. Lisa Rarick, r, r Consulting. Dr. Donna Harrison, a member of the Lifeprex Subcommittee on American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And uh, law professor Carter Sneed, O. Carter Sneed from the University of Notre Dame, former general counsel of the President's Council on Bioethics. Uh, as an oversight committee, it's our customary practice to swear in each of the witnesses. Will you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We thank you each for coming. Thank you for your patience of putting up with the congressional procedure of having multiple amendments and, and bills. It makes it for a long afternoon, but one that we can never predict when we uh, schedule a hearing. So we'll start with Mr. Patterson. Thank you for coming and once again we express on the, uh, from all of us in the committee the loss of your daughter and our sympathies. First of all, I just want to show you a picture of Holly so you know that we're talking about, you know, my daughter and who she is. And would you pull the microphone closer to you? What I said is I wanted to show you a picture of my daughter so at least you, you, you see who, what I've lost and actually what she lost. I owe and dedicate uh, my present here to those who have no voice and particularly to my daughter Holly who died at 18 and the other women who have died or have been seriously hurt by taking RU46 medical abortion drug regimen as a solution to their unplanned pregnancy. I'm here to testify about my personal experience as a father of victim of this drug and my consequent knowledge, experiences and views pertaining to RU46 the drug. I want to be clear that my views and testimony should be divorced from any debate about abortion. I feel we must examine the dangers associated with RU46 for early medical pregnancy termination that are separate and apart from any particular view about a woman's right to access and choice. Twelve days after Holly's 18th birthday on September 10th, 2003, she walked into a Planned Parenthood clinic to be administered an RU46 medical abortion regimen. By the fourth day, she was admitted to the emergency room of a local hospital. She was examined. She was given painkillers. She complained of bleeding, cramping, constipation, and pain. But subsequently, she was sent home. Seven days after taking RU46, Holly returned to the same emergency room hospital complaining of weakness, vomiting, abdominal pain. Hours later, I was called to the hospital where I found her surrounded by doctors and nurses, barely conscious and struggling to breathe. Holly was so weak she could barely hold on to my hand. Feeling utter disbelief and desperation, I watched Holly succumb to a massive bacterial infection as a result of a drug-induced abortion with RU46. With the support of my family and friends, I've spent thousands of hours researching medical and scientific journals, talking to doctors, legislators, state and federal agencies, and to learn about the drug RU46, otherwise known as Mifepristone. I believe that RU46 is a substantial contributing factor responsible for Holly's death. Currently, there have been eight deaths reported by the FDA linked with the drug. Furthermore, there are 900 or more serious health consequences associated with RU46. One year after Holly's death, I met with FDA and White House officials in September of 2004 to discuss concerns over the drug safety and health issues. <coughs> Two months later, the FDA announced additional black box warnings highlighting serious infections and death. On May 11, 2006, I attended the CDC, FDA, NIH scientific conference in Atlanta, whose main purpose was to discuss the safety of the drug regimen RU46 to terminate early pregnancies. I presented a compilation of nearly, nearly 400 medical and scientific publications 
as a result of my two and a half years of extensive research. It is my hope this work will help to facilitate the understanding and causal relationship of RU46 and medical abortion infections. Medical experts, Dr. Esther Sternberg, Dr. James McGregor, Dr. Ralph Meek, presented their concurring studies that RU46 has serious and lethal medical implications as evidenced through animal models. I brought that disc here today for the subcommittee for their review. The FDA is responsible for protecting public health and therefore must reconsider the use of RU46 in early medical pregnancy terminations. It should explore active epidemiology and study animal models that show the alteration of the immune response by its interaction with RU46 as it relates to serious and lethal infections. The FDA needs to provide the medical community reliable means and methods to recognize cases of serious adverse events associated with RU46. Finally, the FDA needs to implement a confident reporting apparatus of these events so they can accurately evaluate the safety and health consequences with the use of the drug. Patients, families, and their physicians are entitled to have all the information necessary to make informed choices. The safety, health, and welfare of women considering medical abortion with RU46 is paramount and should not be jeopardized with a drug that can seriously cause them harm or death. Women have paid the ultimate price with their health and their lives. How many must die needlessly before this drug is removed from the market? Women have been and are still relying upon what they think is truthful information concerning the limited risk involved with a medical abortion. Yet, does the average patient, a teenager like Holly, understand she may be risking her life taking RU46 when she's re repeatedly exposed to statements like, it's what women have wanted for years. It's the first FDA-approved pill providing women with a safe and effective non-surgical option for ending early pregnancy. There are no quick fixes or magical pills to make an unplanned pregnancy go away. My family, friends, and community were deeply saddened and are forever marred by Holly's preventable and tragic death. It is my vibrant memory of Holly and her premature death that have inspired me to make the public aware of the serious and lethal effects of the RU46 regimen. Not a day goes by that I do not recall her brilliant blue eyes, engaging smile, laughter, and sheer gentle beauty. Holly's personal drive and unwavering determination continue to inspire me and give me strength to pursue these critical issues in her name. It's a natural instinct to protect our loved ones and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, and thank your willingness to speak out. Dr. Woods? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the subcommittee. My name is Susan Wood, and for the last 15 years, I've worked in women's health policy within the federal government. In each of my positions, I've advocated for the promotion of women's health through increased research, services, and prevention. From November of 2000 through August of 2005, I was the Assistant Commissioner for Women's Health and Director of the Office of Women's Health at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Prior to that, I was Director of Policy and Program Development at the Department of Health and Human Services Office on Women's Health. But I began my work in women's health in 1990 as congressional staff to the bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. My scientific training is as a PhD in biology, and my research focused on basic cell biology and biochemistry carried out at Boston University and at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Over the last 15 years, I've been proud to be part of the advances we've made in women's <coughs> health. Expanded research at the NIH in areas such as breast and ovarian cancer, osteoporosis, heart disease, HIV AIDS, and menopause. More inclusion of women in clinical research studies funded by NIH and regulated by the FDA. 
increased screening of women for cancer and for sexually transmitted diseases that lead to infertility, better quality mammography, coverage for preventive screenings by Medicare, and improved prevention and services for victims of domestic violence. While I was at FDA, the Office of Women's Health supported groundbreaking research, including research on medications taken during pregnancy to help find out about the proper doses of different medications that should be taken during the different stages of pregnancy. We also funded important health outreach programs in areas such as safe medication use, diabetes, menopause, and hormone therapy. The office also worked to implement and track the inclusion of women in clinical studies reviewed by FDA and to ensure the analysis of the data for important sex differences in safety and efficacy. These advances and more were made through the concerted efforts of members of Congress, the various agencies of the Department of Health and Human Services, the research and clinical communities, and women's health advocates across the country. One of the core principles that led to this progress was and remains ensure that we move forward based on the best available scientific and medical evidence and when that evidence is lacking, go out and do the studies necessary to get it. My commitment to women's health is founded on these scientific principles, knowing that this is the best way to expand our knowledge and improve the health of women and men, both here in the U.S. and abroad. My commitment to women's health, particularly to drug safety, is also founded in personal experience. I lost my much-loved sister to cancer at age 34, caused directly by a drug given to our mother while she was pregnant, the drug DES, also known as diethylstilbestrol. I can assure you that my commitment to drug safety for women is deeply felt and always at the forefront of my mind. And I appreciate your invitation to testify before this subcommittee on the issue of mifepristone and whether or not FDA has held this drug to the best standard of review on safety and efficacy. Let me point out that mifepristone is not Plan B emergency contraception, which prevents unintended pregnancy and the need for abortion. But mifepristone, RU46, is a medication that causes abortion in the first few weeks of pregnancy. Now, I was working at the Department of Health and Human Services Office on Women's Health at the time of the mifepristone review. I therefore have no direct knowledge of the evaluation and review that was happening at FDA. And that's exactly how it should be. The FDA was working independently, reaching its conclusions and decisions based on its usual processes and evaluation of the data. In fact, there was curiosity among many of us at the department level about the subject, but we were given clear instruction by senior management at the department that we were not to inquire, even informally, of our women's health colleagues at FDA about the status of the mifepristone application. This was to ensure that there was not even a perception of departmental influence on this highly visible application. Upon my arrival at FDA in the fall of 2000 as head of women's health there, this independence of decision making was confirmed to me by the professional staff that was directly involved in the review. The evidence presented to the FDA and the subsequent experience with the marketed product in the U.S tells us that it's, this is a safe and effective method for early termination of pregnancy. Now, the recent deaths due to Clostridium sordellii in women who have had a medical abortion are truly tragic. And I do offer my sincere condolences to Mr. Patterson, his family, and the families of all the women. These deaths due to this bacterial infection have put us on notice that health professionals and women need to be aware of this potential risk. More importantly, the close surveillance of adverse events associated with the use of mifepristone have alerted us that this bacterial infection is present and caused the death of other women who've given birth or had a miscarriage, more in fact than the number of women who underwent a medical abortion. This pattern of infections and death after pregnancy is indeed disturbing and tells us once again that we need to do more to ensure safe pregnancy and safe motherhood. This is not limited to women who have been exposed to mifepristone. And to focus solely on the women who have had a medical abortion is to miss the real threat to the health of women. Our surveillance systems for maternal mortality and morbidity have been limited over the years due to limited funding and lower priority. These systems need to be improved and expanded to capture not only the impacts of clostridium, but also so that we can understand and prevent the other risks that women face with pregnancy. With mifepristone, we can be confident 
that we have identified all or most of the adverse events and deaths. We cannot say the same for infections and deaths caused by sordellii in women who have given birth or had a miscarriage, and those numbers may indeed be higher. I applaud the CDC, FDA, and NIH for holding the scientific meeting May 11th to begin the process of examining the data that we currently have on the nature of these infections, potential strategies for prevention, early detection, and effective treatment, and the research agenda that needs to be undertaken to answer the critical questions that exist. Although I did not attend, I understand that meeting participants presented current information and discussed the future needs to address this emerging infection. Questions have been raised about whether mifepristone is involved through changes of the immune system. These are serious questions that need to be studied, but at this point do not seem to be the compelling mechanism. Experts at CDC, FDA, and NIH reviewed the current information and appear to recognize that the infections and deaths due to C. sordellii are not due to a simple drug effect. Rather, this is a complex situation that involves multiple factors that are linked to pregnancy. Getting to the bottom of what puts women at risk for this infection and what can be done to prevent and treat it is of the highest importance. The experts at the meeting last week identified several clear areas of research that are needed, including improved surveillance of infection in women who have given birth or had a miscarriage, improved diagnosis, the role of antibiotics, the possible development of an antitoxin or other therapies, and further research on the nature of the Clostridium bacteria itself. I strongly urge the subcommittee to support this research and surveillance agenda to address this threat to women's health. By doing so, we can improve the health outcome of all pregnant women and also help ensure improved maternal outcomes. Please do not allow politics to trump science once again when the health of women is at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rarick. Good afternoon. And thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to provide testimony in this important discussion of the use of mifepristone for medical abortion. My name is Lisa Rarick. I'm a medical doctor with training and board certification in obstetrics and gynecology. I received my medical degree from Loma Linda University School of Medicine and my OBGYN training at Georgetown University. After my residency, I remained on the faculty of the Department of OBGYN at Georgetown and soon also began to work at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Although my work at the FDA began as a part-time position in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, looking into fetal effects of drug exposure, I quickly grew interested in CEDAR's broader mission of protecting and promoting public health through pharmaceutical regulation. I transitioned to full-time employment at the FDA by September of 1989. My work at CEDAR progressed from the review and analysis of fetal exposure information to work as a primary medical reviewer, also called medical officer, for new drugs in the division of metabolic and endocrine drug products. As a medical officer, I had responsibility for the review of investigational and approved, and approved drugs used in various conditions for women's health. In 1996, a new division, the Division of Reproductive and Urologic Drug Products was created. I was named as its first director. During that time, I was well acquainted with the application for mifepristone and participated in the review as well as the advisory committee meeting discussions regarding this product. I was actively involved in the regulatory actions taken for this product during my tenure as division director. By the year 2000, I continued to move up CEDAR's organization a ladder in, ladder in various positions, and I spent my final year at the FDA, July of 2002 to July of 2003, in the FDA's Office of Women's Health. My conclusions after review of the available scientific information regarding mifepristone while at the agency, as well as my subsequent review, are consistent with the FDA's conclusions. The approval of mifepristone in September of 2000 more than four years after its application was submitted, was based on more than the necessary number of studies submitted and reviewed by the division of which I was director. As many are aware, an application submitted to the FDA to support a new drug approval must contain adequate and well-controlled studies to concern, confirm efficacy and safety. Generally, the word studies is interpreted as requiring two adequate studies. Although there are some instances where one study is acceptable, most applications contain the usual two confirmatory clinical trials. In the case of mifepristone, three studies were submitted in order to establish efficacy and safety for early intrauterine pregnancy termination. 
The clinical review of this product included an analysis of all human studies utilizing mifepristone, including these three large phase three studies involving close to 2,500 women. The Reproductive Health Drugs Advisory Committee was convened in 1996 and asked to discuss and provide recommendations during the review of this application. The committee reviewed these phase three studies. They also heard from over 30 speakers during the open public hearing portion of that meeting. They recommended by a vote of six to nothing with two abstentions that benefits exceeded risk. The approval action taken by the agency in September 2000 utilized the regulatory option of subpart H restrictions for this product. Contrary to the assertion that subpart X H designation was based on a desire for accelerated approval of mifepristone, this is clearly not the case. In this case, the application of subpart H regulations actually provided FDA with more rigorous oversight and allowed for the formal imposition of restricted distribution. In essence, the subpart H approval was meant to restrict the, risk, the use of mifepristone, not accelerate its availability. Clearly, since approval, the FDA has remained extremely vigilant in its regulatory oversight of mifepristone. The labeling has been revised three times since its year 2000 approval. Each of these labeling change actions followed a complete FDA review of the clinical studies and post-marketing information available for mifepristone and resulted in updated presentations of scientific information for consideration by prescribers and patients. Labeling revisions such as these are an important and expected part of drug regulation and indicate active and appropriate review of post-approval information. As with any medication, when reports of serious adverse events associated with mifepristone use are received by FDA, they are carefully analyzed and rigorous investigation is employed to ascertain the relationship, if any, between the drug and the event, as well as to ascertain mechanisms to prevent similar events in the future. I applaud the FDA's efforts uh, to better understand the recent findings of serious bacterial infection reported in a small number of women after mifepristone use and in other pregnancy-related conditions. In particular, as you've heard, the FDA, CDC, and NIH held a joint meeting on May 11th of this year. This meeting was an effort in which experts came together to better understand reports of morbidity and mortality associated with clostridial infections. My understanding from those who attended the meeting is that the rare cases of clostridial infection and death reported in mifepristone users are, at this time, not explained by a simple drug-based association. In fact, the presentations and discussion made it clear that these infections are occurring in various pregnancy-related conditions, not only post-abortion settings. I say this not to dismiss the fact that some infections are occurring in women who have chosen medical abortion, but to emphasize that the agencies must and are looking at the infection trends more broadly. Further investigation and understanding of these infections and various pregnancy-related outcomes is essential. In conclusion, I urge this committee, subcommittee to allow the FDA to continue to do its job. There is no evidence that FDA is shying away from the difficult questions of risk and benefit for this indication. Risks are being investigated. Adverse event reporting for medical abortion is uncovering and forcing investigation of previously unexplored risks related to pregnancy and post-pregnancy events. Let us all continue to support the FDA and others as they fulfill their mission to protect and promote the public health. The public can only have confidence in the FDA's conclusion if it knows it is impervious to political pressure. I urge us to resist the temptation to interfere in this instance and instead for Congress to allow the dedicated public health professionals at the FDA to do their jobs, continue their investigations, and take any actions that might be needed to protect and promote women's health. Thank you. Chairman Sauter, Mr. Uh, Waxman, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the community of the committee. I present my testimony based on my observations and research as a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist who has personally examined 850 of the 950 adverse event cases reported to the FDA after RU486 abortion, and also based on data from the CDC presented at the CDC workshop in Atlanta last week, which I, I attended. The FDA outlined areas of consideration prior to withdrawal appro withdrawing approval of RU46, and these are as follows. Examining the evidence that RU46 caused the adverse events, how soon these events occurred after RU46, how severe these events are, can these adverse events be predicted or avoided, and how safe is the alternative treatment, surgical abortion. I'll speak first about the five Clostridia sordelli deaths. At the CDC FDA workshop in Atlanta last week, Drs. Sternberg, Meek, and McGregor detailed the evidence that RU46 interferes with the body's ability to fight infection by blocking glucocorticoid receptors in the immune system. 
One of the many studies demonstrated that mice injected with a certain bacterial product die at a rate of 13%. But when these mice are given even tiny doses of RU486, 100% of the mice die. The five women who have died from infection with C. sordelli during their RU486 abortions tragically illustrate the same concept, as illustrated by data from the CDC presented by Drs. Fisher and McGregor. The statement has been made by some spokespeople from the FDA that the C. sordelli deaths may be due to a change in the bacteria itself. This question was specifically addressed and specifically refuted by CDC data presented by Dr. McDonald. Some FDA spokespeople have implied that there are comparable numbers of deaths from C. sordelli in term pregnancy. This is epidemiological nonsense. Dr. Fisher reported CDC data which revealed five deaths from C. sordelli in 550,000 RU46 abortions. Dr. Fisher reported eight deaths from C. sordelli in 30 years out of well over 70 million deliveries. The risk of death from C. sordelli with RU46 is well over 50 times greater. Dr. Fisher reported no deaths from C. sordelli in 30 years of surgical abortion data. Dr. Green reported 25 deaths from other causes of infections in 13,161,608 surgical abortions. The risk of death from Clostridium sordelli with RU46 is 10 times greater than the risk of death from all other kinds of infections in surgical abortion. Dr. Green from Harvard recently published uh, this data. Remember also that the women who died during their RU46 abortions were all healthy. They had no risk factors predisposing them to death, especially from a bacteria that rarely causes death in humans with a normal immune system. The CDC FDA panelists were unable to identify any risk factors to predict who is more likely to die from C. sordelli infection, nor could they identify any treatment that would save a woman once she was diagnosed with C. sordelli infection. C. sordelli infection during an RU46 abortion is 100% fatal despite any and all treatment. These deaths are completely preventable. But septic deaths are not the only health hazard posed by RU46 abortions. At least 116 women have been transfused for massive bleeding, and at least 54 of them lost over one half of their blood volume. The medical literature states that one to two out of every thousand women will need to be transfused for massive hemorrhage. Studies that compared surgical and RU46 abortions show much higher rates of blood loss in RU46 abortions. These are detailed in my written testimony. And there is no way to predict who will hemorrhage. The hazards to women's health from just the infections and hemorrhages alone due to RU486 clearly constitute ample cause for the FDA to withdraw approval from RU486. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Sneed. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chairman Souter, uh, Ranking Member Cummings, uh, Ranking Member Waxman, Congresswoman Schmidt. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me today to discuss uh, the legal dimensions of, of this question, which I think are um, not controversial and not contentious, despite the, the, uh, the, the, the contentious, contentious nature of the, of the underlying issue that we're discussing. Um, in my written comments, I lay out uh, for the committee the various regulatory options that the FDA would have uh, and also that the Se Secretary of Health and Human Services would have uh, if, if they were to decide that the, situ the circumstances warranted intervention uh, in this matter beyond the changing and labeling and, uh, and the public health advisories that have already been undertaken. Um, the FDA and the, the central conclusion that I, that I reach in my, in my written testimony is that the FDA is well equipped to respond forcefully to the concerns raised by the co-panelists today regarding the safety of mifepristone should it decide that such a response uh, is warranted. Uh, and I focus on three principal mechanisms in my, in my uh, written testimony that are available both to the FDA and to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. In my oral testimony, I'm going to focus on the one mechanism that is unique to mifepristone given the circumstances uh, of its approval. That is to say, under subpart H, which has received some discussion today already. Um, subpart H uh, was devised by the FDA to permit the approval of drugs intended to treat serious or life-threatening illnesses where such drugs imposed a greater than normal acceptable risk to the patient. That is, subpart H was designed in part as an alternative means of approval for useful drugs 
that would otherwise fail the traditional risk benefit calculus required for FDA approval. Subpart H facilitated approval of such drugs by imposing additional post-marketing restrictions above and beyond what was required through the normal mechanisms of approval, as has been mentioned by numerous panelists. These post-market restrictions are absolutely crucial, uh, both in terms of their effectiveness and, uh, and uh, in terms of compliance with those restrictions if the mechanism of subpart H is to, be, is to serve its purpose. Uh, as the FDA had said in its own final rule, for, uh, and I'm quoting from the, uh, the final rule, for drugs approved under the accelerated procedure regulations, the risk-benefit assessment is dependent upon the likelihood that post-marketing restrictions will enable safe use. Uh, most important for present purposes, uh, it's clear that subpart H provides a mechanism for expedited withdrawal of, of approval upon a finding that the post-marketing restrictions are either ineffective or are not being observed by the, uh, by the, uh, the manufacturer. Uh, as the FDA noted in its final rule also, if the restrictions do not lead to safe use, the risk-benefit assessment for these drugs changes significantly. FDA believes that if that occurs, rapid withdrawal of approval as set forth in this rule is important to the public health. So this is a, a unique mechanism, and, and as the, as the uh, representatives and former representatives of the FDA have, have noted already, subpart H uh, is intended to facilitate the, uh, the, the move to market of drugs through the imposition of these additional post-market restrictions. Uh, and it's not difficult to see the implications of subpart H for the case of mifepristone. Um, Danko Laboratories benefited from the, these unique approval regulations, the cost of which uh, was a promise to comply with the post-market restrictions that the FDA thought appropriate under the circumstances. Thus, if the FDA, and I formulate this as a conditional because uh, I am not privy to any facts that would go to this conclusion, this is a judgment that would have to be made based on an evaluation of Danko's behavior, if in fact the FDA were to conclude that Danko was not in compliance with these post-market restrictions, or alternatively that the post-market restrictions themselves were not effective to, to render the, the drug safe uh, for its approved use, uh, then the uh, FDA would uh, be within its authority to withdraw approval following notice and an opportunity for hearing uh, for, the, for the drug itself. Uh, and in fact, it would, be, it would be difficult to imagine that if FDA did come to that conclusion that they would not regard it as its duty to withdraw approval because in the absence of effective post-market restrictions, mifepristone would presumably not be able to satisfy the statutory criteria for safety. Uh, if this were not the case, mifepristone would have been approved under the traditional provisions rather than under subpart H. So essentially, um, uh, among the mechanisms that I discuss in my written testimony, subpart H provides a unique opportunity for the FDA to, uh, to maintain control over uh, the use of mifepristone. And if, under its own inquiries, the FDA finds that the post-marketing restrictions are not effective or are not being observed, then the truncated and expedited withdrawal provisions would be activated and FDA would be fully authorized to withdraw uh, approval. Um, and uh, as, and uh, as, as has been suggested, I, I agree, I think FDA would have the obligation to answer any open questions regarding the efficacy of the post-market restrictions uh, and also to answer, to inquire about and answer any questions and respond appropriately to any concerns regarding Danko's compliance with the post-marketing restrictions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to start with a question for Dr. Wood and Dr. Rarick. Uh, in your testimony, you were pretty aggressively said, both of you, that there was no evidence to support the hypothesis that mifepristone interferes with the immune response. NIH researcher Esther Sternberg's studies directly conflict with your assertion. Uh, Dr. Sternberg has conducted and cited animal studies that demonstrate that RU486 can suppress natural immune response. Dr. Jamie McGregor of the Los Angeles Women's and Children's Hospital has published work hypothesizing the pathway by which C. sardelli causes uh, multi-organs infection after suppressing the immune response. Ralph Meinch of Brown University describes a mechanism whereby RU486 suppresses the immune system and causes shock. Have either of you read in entirety any of these papers, not just a summary, but have read those papers, and are you aware of any research that calls into the question Sternberg, McGregor, and Mensch's conclusion that mifepristone may interfere with the immune response? You made a flat assertion. What about those studies? No, I have not read those studies in full. However, I spoke to Dr. Sternberg um, and discussed her findings. 
And I would agree with you that there are certain, this is certainly a pathway that needs to be investigated. I think uh, the issues and the, 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 the questions that arise about studies is that they are not questioning the studies themselves or even the outcomes of their studies, but they are in fact limited to particular species of rat and mouse and do not apply to across even the different species of rats and mice. Um, there's great variability in the level of the responses uh, to different things. Uh, this is an extraordinarily complex issue of how the immune system is regulated, either regulated up or regulated down by various glucose. So let me ask you. Let, let me ask so you. This is, this is complex, and I agree with you. There are let me ask you this question. As I understand, so I don't misrepresent what you said. You said you've talked to Dr. Sternberg, and you think that it's inconclusive. But in fact, uh, in certain type of animals, the study shows that it suppresses. In her animal studies, it shows what it shows. And, it's very and you have, you're not familiar with McGregor or Mench's studies? No, I have, I have then how in the world, under oath, could you make an assertion like you did, under oath? I asserted that this is a very a worthwhile and serious pathway to, to explore. You said there was no evidence. Under like oath, you said there was no evidence. I Okay. Um, Dr. Rarick, uh, um, the, uh, Dr. Dr. Rarick, are you familiar with these studies? Have you read them through? And No, and I did not attend the meeting at the CDC. I similarly looked at some of the slides from the CDC presentations. I don't, I think the last part of your question was the most key word which you said, don't you agree that they may? Be a, that there may be a mechanism, and I'm, where I don't think we're disputing that there may be some mechanism of mifepristone and glutocorticoid receptor issues, and that the science in animals may have both sides of this story. Pregnancy, as you well know, is a complicated hormonal milieu with all kinds of receptor activations and inactivations of the various hormones that are happening during a pregnancy and post-pregnancy. I, I, I think the last part of your question, which was may, do, they, do we know that mifepristone is causing an immune reaction in women? No. Might they? Possibly. Well, it's very important because um, I was subjected to opening statement after opening statement with the implication that we're inserting politics. You and your statement said it's, it's really interesting because if you want to restore the faith of the American people, they have to feel that there's actually an honest debate going on and there's an increasing feel that certain people who get control of the establishment research want to jam their views down everybody else and not listen to alternative research. And the assertion was made that there is no contradiction. There is a debate going on. We need to make sure that debate uh, goes, goes through. Now, I was blown off in a question, quite frankly, to the uh, assistant commissioner on the uh, blood question. Dr. Harrison, my understanding of what you, did you go through the different cases on the, those who were reported and it, you seem to imply that these were transfusion cases and fairly serious bleeding, whereas I got the impression, oh, bleeding's common, this wasn't extraordinary bleeding. Um, I've had a chance, an opportunity to review 850 of the 950 cases which we obtained by Freedom of Information Act. Um, of those 950 cases, I reviewed 68 women who were transfused. Of those 68 women who were transfused, nine, uh, we have nine transfusion cases where the women received over four units of blood. We have 10 cases where um, they refu uh, received over three units of blood. Um, and then, and uh, 38 cases where two units of blood were transfused. Uh, and there were also 10 cases where the adverse event report to the FDA did not document the number of cases transfused. And this was in settings where the, the clinical picture in the adverse event report was consistent with massive hemorrhage, which to me is um, unconscionable if you are accurately trying to uh, uh, give the description of how much bleeding is there to not even have a hemoglobin concentration or not even have a uh, amount of blood transfused. In addition to those that I reported in my paper, which is what I just quoted, um, there were an additional 12 uh, in the uh, adverse event cases from September 2004 to July of 2005. And I would refer you to my um, spreadsheet that I gave you. So that, um, and of those cases, um, 
the 12 that I mentioned were life-threatening hemorrhages. Now, so of the life-threatening hemorrhages, it's uh, basically 54 life-threatening hemorrhages altogether as of July 2005. When I use the CTCAE criteria for coding these, that's a criteria that's used by the <coughs> national, developed by the National Cancer Institute to grade adverse events and to determine how serious they are so that you can compare them. Um, what I used was a criteria of a woman with a documented hemoglobin of less than seven. Remember, the normal hemoglobin is 13 and transfused at least two units. So these are women who have lost over half of their blood volume. We have, uh, I have in that time from September of 2000 to July of 2005, um, <coughs> 54 cases. Now, if you look at that compared to the number that the FDA <coughs> reports uh, which is 119. That's almost half of the women who were transfused were, were in life-threatening situations. And I, that is not the kind of bleeding that you normally expect from surgical abortion. It is also not the kind of bleeding that you normally expect from a spontaneous abortion. In fact, it's more comparable to the kind of bleeding you see in major motor vehicle <coughs> accidents. So this bleeding that's being um, uh, uh, said as normal and expected is a large amount of blood. Thank you. One, one question for Mr. Sneed on the, um, is there a way that during additional research, and maybe Dr. Rurik or, or, or Dr. Wood would be able to answer this, <coughs> under a normal research that a drug cannot be taken, uh, to me taken off the market implies it's not coming back on, but could be suspended while additional research is done? Sure. Um, there is the, the I take up three mechanisms in my uh, in my testimony. Two of which are, are are mechanisms that require notice and an opportunity for a hearing before the actual approval is withdrawn. But the third option that I take up is actually an option that's exercisable only by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. It's a non-delegable authority vested in the Secretary of Health and Human Services to declare a particular drug an imminent hazard, and if if he does so. The effect of that is to immediately suspend the approval of the drug, and then the manufacturer is then provided an expedited sort of post facto uh, hearing to, to make their case for why the, uh, it was improvidently declared an imminent hazard. What about, uh, can the, what about if th that still puts the burden up, because this is a, obviously a very <coughs> explosive political question, because it is, a, uh, it is abortion, whether I like it or not, or whether anybody likes it or not, it's a legal process, and we don't have a right to stop it. Uh, that uh, I personally have my views on R-46, other members have their views on R-46. The, the, the question is um, to say that it's being stopped and then the manufacturer has to, to make a case is different than saying additional research needs to be done and that the, the because the that would imply that the government has determined that it's unsafe as opposed to additional research needs to be done. That's right. I, in order to in order to affect the imminent hazard privilege that the secretary enjoys, he would have to make a determination that it does in fact present an imminent threat, which is a judgment about the 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 safety of the drug itself. There is a provision uh, in the in the regulations for an administrative stay. Uh, the, the, it, the secretary or the commissioner has the authority to stay the effective date of any decision at any point in the process, which is real, which I think is more of what you're talking about, which is sort of a, a, the equivalent in, in civil litigation to a, a temporary restraining order or a permanent injunction, which sort of holds in place, which freezes the status quo, and then and then tries to resolve whatever disputed questions that there might be. Mr. Cummings, <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Wood, I want to go back for a moment. I, I have always been one to, uh, I don't like to leave things hanging. It seems like you were trying to say something, uh, and I want to give you that opportunity. Uh, the chairman asked you some questions and uh, implied that you said something that you did not, that you said you didn't say. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to clear that up. If you like, if you don't want to, that's fine. I would just make the, the point that, um, <coughs> I actually agree with the chairman and also with Mr. Patterson about the need for answering all of these questions. Is the immune system involved or compromised? Uh, it, what is it that caused, what it causes this bacteria to become so virulent in women? Uh, what is it about pregnancy, either the ending of pregnancy, either through termination or through childbirth, uh, that somehow uh, 
has led to these, these deaths and these infections. Uh, so I actually would agree that more research is necessary. Um, and my statement in my, in my written statement, and I believe orally, was that I just don't, my reading of it at the point is that the evidence is not compelling to be conclusive that that's the answer. But I certainly would urge any and all uh, research to address these questions. Thank you very much. Let me uh, just go on from there. The, um, you know, tell me, Dr. Wood, why would, uh, can you explain why some women would prefer uh, mefeprex over surgical abortion? Mifeprex uh, is available to women much earlier in the course of pregnancy. <coughs> and so the termination of the pregnancy can be done in a matter of days after the pregnancy is established of implantation uh, in the womb uh, and, and up to several weeks. This is much earlier than a regular surgical abortion, which is required to wait a few more weeks. So this provides an earlier uh, m option if, if a woman has determined to end the pregnancy. Um, it's also uh, one that can be uh, uh, more private and also avoid surgery, which certainly many people prefer uh, in, in, in making a decision. Uh, I would also agree that all access to all information about any known risk as they become known for e any type of medical procedure needs to be available to women. And in the case of Mifeprex, because of the uh, patient information uh, that's required under the distribution uh, uh, restrictions on Mifeprex, that in fact um, we can work to assure that all women do get um, up-to-date information on any risk of any uh, medical abortion. It seems that the you know, as I listened to Mr. Sneed and uh, I listened to the, your testimony and others, it seems as if the, the key question is where is the line drawn with regard to taking a drug off the market? And I'm just trying to figure out what's taken into account when determining whether a drug should stay on the market, like, like this, for example. It seems that Mr. Sneed has... Uh, very eloquently uh, stated um, all the options that could happen if the line is crossed. The question, it seems to me, is where is the line and when is it crossed? I think that, that question is actually the type of question that FDA has to deal with every day looking at every product. Uh, when they get in uh, reports of adverse events or deaths. And it's not simply the reports of the deaths, but it is whether or not there are causal links, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of the, of the response, how uh, uh, many people are affected in terms of uh, the baseline use. Um, there are many factors in trying to determine when a product uh, should come off the market. It's not a simple question, but it is that balance of risk <coughs> and benefit. Um, and, and, and again, that's something that the, the scientists and clinicians at FDA do every day, and I would just urge that they be allowed to continue what they're doing, which is investigating this, evaluating it, and making their determinations without um, intervention. Now, have you ever been in a position, uh, either you or Dr. Raddick, rhetoric where you were say for example any position to and you certain evidence were was presented to you and you were the person who suggested that we or had the power to suggest that FDA take another look at a drug to determine whether or not it stays on the market at all either one of you I think I can speak to that thank you FDA does that kind of determination all the time. Every time you see a new labeling come out on a product, that means the FDA has re-looked at the studies as well as the post-marketing events to assess that maybe there's a new safety issue that needs to be put in the label or not. When those discussions happen, there's always the option of considering withdrawal of the product if those risks outweigh benefits. And that calculation is done often for all the products that are available. Well, I see my time is up, but just one last question. You, you heard Dr. Harrison. Is there anything that she said that would make you all say, well, you know, maybe, and I, I'm just trying to 
be fair here, um, make you all say, well, maybe this is something we need to take another look at? I'm, I'm just curious. Have you heard something, anything here today that caused you any kind of uh, radar to, to go up? Um, my perspective is what I've heard here today is extremely important, but it's all information that the FDA is well aware of. Okay. The adverse event reporting that Dr. Harrison is quoting is from the FDA. Okay. They are looking at this every day. They were involved in the CDC meeting last week. Uh, my, my impression from this discussion is that, yes, FDA is on the case. It's looking into this. Uh, these are really important questions, and they should take an action that's, that, that is appropriate with the data. Okay, thank you very much. I want to make sure in the record that we're clear. Um, the uh, Dr. Wood stated this is a question to be studied. And to the degree I said there was, you said there was no evidence, that was incorrect. But you did say if the immune system were suppressed, we would expect to see, and we didn't. We would expect to have seen this, and we didn't. Similarly, we would expect to see this, and we didn't. This, thus far, this pattern has not emerged. Basically, what you said was there was no evidence. Um, and what I asked you was th about three studies. Then you said those, those studies need to be studied further. And then on, on top of that, uh, you had um, uh, 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 denied in effect what was the consensus of the CDC panel that there was, in fact, evidence. Dr. Rarick said in her statement, to date there is no evidence has emerged to support the uh, hypothesis of which um, did not refute either of the three studies or the fact that the scientific community at a recent panel of which n neither of you were present concluded the opposite conclusion. Now, more research needs to be done on it. I'll grant that. A and I think that's been, been clear today. But it was not a false assertion that I made uh, about uh, uh, Dr. Rarick said specifically in her testimony, no evidence, and Dr. Wood basically didn't cite any evidence. But I think we all agree more study needs to be done to see how common and, and the, how you disaggregate the, t the two types of things. The gentleman yield just for one second of clarification. I, I, Mr. Chairman, all, all I was trying to do, when, and I asked the question, is I don't like for witnesses. I think when people are, these are professional people, and I don't want them to ever be in a position where they come before the committee and for whatever reason they don't get a chance to explain something that puts into question uh, what they have said, their credibility. And I just think it's as one human being to another, uh, they do that. That's all. And, and I uh, understand the gentleman's concern, but you also know in a five-minute rule that she had answered the question. She was then off to another, and I didn't mean to cut her ability off to respond. And that's why I wanted to grant that you, in fact, said more study was needed. And the direct, there was no evidence quote, was actually Dr. Rarick's, not uh, Dr. Wood's. But Dr. Wood had a series of things that suggested there wasn't. And I, I want to make sure the record reflects accurately, as you did. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually have uh, questions for Dr. Rorick, Dr. Harrison, and Mr. Patterson, if that's all right. Um, Dr. Rorick, uh, Dr. Wood stated that uh, politics, she didn't want to see politics, tri politics triumphing science once again. Um, and, and none of us want to see that. Uh, my concern is um, how this product came to market in, in 2000. Um, Dr. Wood stated that controlled trials were performed in support of the RU486 FDA application. Could you tell us what the control group was in those trials that made those trials controlled? More specifically, uh, was there a, a double-blind study, and if so, how, how did it result? Certainly. Um, in this area of pregnancy-related conditions, including contraception or birth control, oftentimes the FDA accepts clinical trial designs that are appropriate and use historical controls. So for example, you can't have women who come in and want to contracept and suggest that they should be blinded and randomized to placebo versus a contraceptive that you expect to work and expect that to be an ethical trial design. Similarly, in, a, in medical abortion, when a 
woman comes in with a request to terminate a pregnancy, you can't suggest to her, well, we think this pill will terminate your pregnancy based on all the science, but we want you to sign a consent form that states you'll be randomized to a pill that we know has no effect, a sugar pill, a placebo pill, on, a, on, on your pregnancy, and then let us know if you abort or not. That's just simply not a reasonable trial design. In this setting, you know if you don't do anything, there's, there's the most, almost 100 percent chance that they'll continue to be pregnant, although there is a miscarriage rate, as you well know. But in an early intrauterine pregnancy termination, you can't expect placebo to have any potential effect. So you go back to the sort of historical control concept that if you didn't give the woman anything, what would be the chances of her aborting versus giving her something? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I've got to comment on this because I'm troubled by this statement. In 1995, my father was involved in a very critical car wreck, and he almost died. And they put him on a clinical trial uh, regarding uh, getting him off of oxygen because the longer you stay on oxygen, the harder it is to get off the oxygen. It was a double-blind study. We didn't know whether they were giving him the opportunity to wean off quicker or not. Uh, the, the alternative, obviously, is... is, is more of an opportunity to die. So th the argument that a double-blind study can't be used in this case, but it can be used in a life-or-death case of, an, of a man uh, in, in an ICU unit at University Hospital, that, that just doesn't fly in my face. And that's what makes me concerned with all of this, is that um, I believe politics was there in, in 2000. I think that uh, while, while I was back home in another role in my life, I think that there was a rush to judgment to get this drug to market. And uh, what we're seeing now are some problems that are arising from it. Um, my concern is we don't have a, adequate knowledge one way or another whether RU486 has a direct or an indirect cause for death. We do know that there is a relationship between the death and the taking of the drug. We don't know whether it's direct or indirect. But we do know that there is a relationship. And my concern is that politics, once again, is playing out. But my next question is actually for uh, Dr. Harrison. Um, your, your colleagues say that if the theory were true that Mepoprex comprised the immune system, then we would see a higher rate of other kinds of infections. Uh, your, your colleagues say this. W what, what is your response to that? Well, I think the focus of the CDC meeting and most of our discussion today has been on the infectious deaths. But there were actually um, at least seven other life-threatening infections to date in the 850 um, severe adverse event reports that I reviewed, one of them being a 15-year-old who spent several weeks in the intensive care unit but lived. So there's an issue of critically looking at those infectious infection-related complications. And there's a secondary issue in even identifying those infection-related complications. Because if mifepristone suppresses the immune system, the infection may not be pelvic. And if it's not pelvic, it may not be recognized as being related to uh, the mifepristone abortion and therefore never reported. So we have a number of women walking around potentially with a decreased immune system or a decreased uh, ability to fight off infection whose connection with their mifepristone abortion will, will not be known. And that's, that's a big concern. Thank you. And, and my final question is for you, Mr. Patterson. And, and I'm so glad that you're brave enough to bring this to our attention. And I know that your daughter is uh, smiling down on you. You are a very brave and brave person. Um, what do you have to say about the assertion that the benefits for, for RU486 outweigh the risks associated with it, and what do you think should be done to protect other families from um, the same tragic fate that your family continues to experience? Well, I think if you were to ask Holly here today, uh, had she lived, if the uh, benefit outweighed the risk, uh, I think she would disagree. Uh, I, I have spent uh, many, many <coughs> hours uh, researching this drug, and I can tell you that uh, I feel very strongly about the, uh, the link that this drug does impair the innate immune system and predisposes women to these, and can predispose these women to serious and lethal infections. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion at that at the CDC uh, 
uh, FDA and uh, NIH conference. And uh, I think the research is absolutely necessary. I think we have information that has come out from some very well-renowned and respected doctors. It, uh, it's very compelling that we, we need to pursue this research to answer these questions. Had Holly been given all the information in the very beginning to, uh, to you know, talking about this, uh, the, the, the risk-benefit profile and, and weighing those options, uh, I think that had she been given all the information she needed, she certainly would not have chosen uh, an RU46 abortion because Holly was not the kind of young lady that would risk her life or uh, for any reason whatsoever, being the pinnacle of fitness that she, you know, and the type of uh, healthy individual that she was, she would have chosen an alternate method. And I uh, can't say enough that it's all about having all the information to make an informed choice that is in the best interest of that particular individual and the family that are making those decisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to sort out these different uh, uh, positions, and I guess the first thing we're talking about is an infection that has proved to be fatal in some cases, and this infection is called uh, C. sordellii. And the first question is, is this infection caused by this drug? Uh, people who didn't use this drug have had this infection. Is that accurate, Dr. Rarick? So, it, so whether so, it's not it's not related exclusively to this drug. Now we know that some people who use this drug had the infection. We don't know whether it caused the infection. Is that accurate? Correct. Uh, so we need to we need to get an answer to that. If if the theory is that it, the immune system is suppressed because of the uh, RU486. Wouldn't we have a lot of evidence more of other infections besides this one? Because this is a fairly rare kind of infection, isn't it? It's a very rare infection, and I think this situation is that it's, it seems to be cropping up in pregnancy-related events, not just medical abortion, but deliveries, vaginal and cesarean, and other conditions of post-pregnancy con conditions. I think the FDA is um, actively looking at whether they agree or not that mifepristone has any component of making it a higher risk in women who are using it for medical mm -hmm. abortion versus other kinds of miscarriages or pregnancy terminations. Mm -hmm. Well, this is uh, not an issue that congressmen should decide. This is, this is a very clear scientific issue. Uh, evidence ought to be reviewed very carefully. The Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health all met on this issue la this last week. Is that correct, um, Dr. Wood? So they're, they're looking at it. Uh, Dr. Harrison, do you have any information that the FDA does not have? No, I, I have less information than the FDA does. My information on the adverse event reports were obtained by FOIA of, mm -hmm. from, uh, the, from FDA. the FDA. And my information that I presented on the risk of Cisordelli was directly from the notes that I took from the uh, uh, meeting in Atlanta on Did, Dr. Fisher were you able to and share Dr. McDonald's testimony, who both are from the CDC. Were you able to share your views with people at the FDA and perhaps at that meeting last week? Um, I was not a participant, and the um, panelists, the speakers, and those who were in research were segregated from the rest of the observers. I was in an observer spot and uh, not allowed to talk with uh, the speakers until after. Well, are you able to submit your, your views to them in writing? Um, they, uh, uh, someone from the FDA has requested a reprint of my mm -hmm. uh, adverse event analysis that was printed in January, and um, I think that was the last uh, request that I had or contact with the FDA. You're listed on our list of witnesses today as a member of the Mifeprex Subcommittee of the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And in January 2001, your organization issued a statement. This was several months after FDA's approval of mif Mifepristone. The statement said, quote, 
the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists opposes the destruction of an unborn human being at any stage of development. Therefore, we oppose pharmaceutical abortion with the same vigor that we oppose surgical abortion, end quote. Would, would your organization hold the same position on mefepristone no matter what the safety data said? I did not write that statement, although I am a member of the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We characterize ourselves as pro-woman and pro-life. And this is a woman's health issue. When it becomes clear that a method of abortion uh, is 10 to 50 times more risky than its alternative, then this takes it out of the realm of the abortion debate and puts it into the realm of the women's health debate. Well, no, no doubt about we, it, but your, organiza start, excuse start me, your organization, excuse me, like your organization. No, no, let me, because I only have a very limited time. Your organization's position is that you oppose destruction of an unborn human being at any stage of development whether it's a pharmaceutical abortion or a surgical abortion. So if that's your organization's position, it's really unrelated to how safe or unsafe this may be. I gather what you're saying is in addition to that, you feel it's unsafe, but your organization started off with the position that you don't want any abortions under any circumstances. Uh, Do you subscribe to that view? And I wouldn't agree with the way you said it, no. Um, what I would say is that in Not this particular... Yes, sir. You do not have to state your position on abortion, or I'm going to ask all the witnesses their position on abortion. Well, Mr. The Chairman, question is, uh, is what the, Mr. the Chairman, issue at hand is, not what her personal position no, on Mr. abortion is. No, Mr. Chairman, she is here representing an organization, and that organization has taken a position against abortion under any circumstances. And they took that position when RU486 was approved without any of these other complications or possible causations or connections ever came about. And so my, my, my uh, question of her is, since they took that position, no matter what the safety data said, w w what, w how I should view that as a representative from that organization. Okay. Did you agree with the organization's position, even if the safety data didn't convince you further that this is a possible problem with this drug? If the issue were whether or not there's a human being being destroyed during the RU-46 abortion process, that is a separate and completely different issue than the issue this committee is authorized and mandated to look at, which is oversight of the FDA process by which uh, this drug was approved, and are they doing their job to take an unsafe drug off the market? Well, I appreciate so that. I, I, agree, I appreciate that. And our, and our job is to make sure that the FDA is doing its job, but FDA is a scientific based organization, they have to follow the science. It may lead to a conclusion one way or it may lead to a conclusion another way, but I want them to follow the science, not some preconceived notion. And I, I think that's the important point that I would make. I see my time is up and uh, I will uh, conclude on that note. May I respond if there's, to that? Well, no, because we're not going to argue that issue. The, uh, the, the position, it seems to me, is there may be a problem that's related to this drug. There may be a problem that has no relationship to this drug. It, let's get the truth. Let's get to the scientific uh, evidence and let the scientists decide it, not politicians, no matter what our views may be on the uh, abortion question, because this is strictly, to me, a scientific question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Waxman and I uh, fence a lot in, in the media, even though we have tremendous personal respect for each other and get along really well. And it's awkward when we're, we have deeply held views of he believes that I and others are trying to impose our political views, and I and others believe the political views have been posed on the system already. And that, uh, that but what I really find uh, disconcerting, and I understand where you were headed here, uh, because there are two issues. We can't undo whatever abortion rights there are in America. This is a question on, about this drug. But you cannot possibly hold the position that pro-life people who oppose abortion can't participate in a debate. And I wouldn't take that position. Then I certainly is, wouldn't take that position. The, what is the relevance of her position on RU486? It, because what, if you're asking her, can she be neutral on the research, that's the question, not what her position is. No, my, is. my question related to the fact that if she's representing an organization that, that took the position, we don't care about safety data. We're just against the, the, the drug accomplishing the purpose for which it's intended, which is, to, which is to terminate a pregnancy. 
If, if that's your position, you don't want, if, let's put it the other way. If you had somebody who said, I want to uh, terminate a pr all pregnancies when anybody wants to do it, which is not my position, by the way. Uh, I, w I w don't want to see abortions, but I don't want the decision made by you or Mr. Cummings or myself. It ought to be made by the individual with a consultation with uh, the physician and, and ethicist and others. It's a personal decision, not one to be decided in Washington. But if somebody takes the position that they're from an organization that's against RU486 under any circumstances, even if it were safe, then you sort of wonder, well, if they come in and say, well, we don't want this drug because it's unsafe, uh, uh, I, th I think her views ought to be submitted to the uh, FDA and they ought to evaluate I, I don't. I don't think that that is a, uh, I think that in effect, that's why so many conservatives have a deep distrust of our current research structure when we hear that it's non-political, because in fact what you just outlined was something, uh, a position that somebody who deeply believes that all babies are human cannot detach that view or should be somehow demeaned if they belong to any organization that's pro-life as if we're under extra scrutiny as a, a doctor, as a researcher, as a politician that somehow then we're not allowed to have a scientific discussion without wondering whether our motives are impure. Well, she's not here as a, as a well-known doctor, in, uh, as, as, as I understand it. She's listed as here representing this organization. Now, if she happened to be somebody from NIH or a researcher, very well known in the field, and she's here for her expertise alone, that's one thing. But she's here representing an organization. You, you didn't, it's really, uh, it's really interesting because she gave very compelling testimony, very detailed testimony on the individual individual cases, more than we got by far on blood transfusion actually from FDA, and that uh, rather than debate about her testimony, you choose to attack the witness. Now, I'm not attacking her, but Mr. Patterson's daughter died, didn't die from hemorrhaging. She died from this particular infection. And this infection is a very dangerous infection, and we would need to know if it's connected to this drug. If it is, even though I'm pro-choice, I'd be the first, along with you, to say it ought to be taken off the market or it ought to be labeled as such. But if, it, if it's not uh, a, a, a safety threat, then I don't think it ought to be accused of being uh, a problem just because uh, it shouldn't have been approved in the first place by the people who want to take it off. Furthermore, she's a published uh, author and research uh, documents. I'm Mr. I, I Chairman, I think in fairness, I want to know where everybody stands on the issue of abortion. I, mean, I, I don't think, I don't think. Do you want to start off with yourself? I, I sure, don't think. I'd be more than happy to. <laughs> uh, reclaiming, I, I do, I think the line of questioning was inappropriate. I, I made my, my statement. Uh, Mr. Waxman is the senior ranking member of the full committee. He's free to do that. I think the public can judge whether that was a, a fair approach, but it certainly will reinforce people across the country who are watching a feeling that there is a discrimination uh, against people who are pro-life from being able to participate in research, and that's some of why there's so much questioning about this whole science debate. Yeah, would you yield to me just to make one comment? I appreciate your, your views. I don't agree with you, but the only comment I would make is that the General Accountability Office did an evaluation of FDA's action on the Plan B contraceptive drug, and even though the scientific committee appointed to review it said it should be approved, even though the researchers at NIH said it should be approved, it appeared that a political judgment was made because of the Bush administration that it shouldn't be approved and its approval is now in limbo. Many of us look at that as clear politics when the science points in a different direction. I want to know what the science says about this issue. And uh, you say it's compelling. It's not compelling if scientists uh, are still evaluating the, ma the matter. I want them to uh, see whether it is compelling, whether there's a clear case made, and I don't want politics interfering with science. It's, uh, you can keep repeating that, but the funny thing is, is I've been a staffer here, I've been a member here. We all know who requests the GAO study, who is picked on the GAO study, which is heavily steered. GAO will do a study on either side, depending on who basically pushes it and, and what mixes are. We have gone into this. Well, now you're attacking the GAO's I, credibility I am, just I, because they I came am, up with a study no, that you disagreed with. No, I am questioning. That's more, that's more of an attack than uh, I ever did with Dr. Harrison. As the GAO. And I didn't mean I attack her under any circumstances. As the, as the GAO, as I've said, that when you get into controversial political subjects, the GAO, how you phrase the question, wh who does it, if any, any honest, f forget here for a second that the TV on, you know full well 
that we have problems in the GAO as far as what kind of study you get back and to act like it is a pure scientific study of the GAO. They do good research, they research it, but they are going to have a bias based on who is put on a given study and who is requesting the different study. And if I request it with Republicans, you're going to get a slightly different study back than you do. And uh, there are subjects that aren't that uh, led uh, kind of laden with the political overlay on this, and the J.O. will be very forthright. You can go through the researchers they contracted. You can look at the footnotes. You can look at the previous published records of it. I'm saying the G.O. Oh, is transparent on it, but when you go through the evaluation, you'll see who they hired as a contractor will determine what research they get back. We have another uh, member yes, who wants I, to ask I, questions, I, but I just want to defend G.A.O. in this. It, y requesting a study by G.A.O. doesn't mean that they have to come out with your preferred conclusion, I think they have a lot more integrity and honesty than you're suggesting, and they can decide who they're going to uh, do the investigation. Uh, uh, I, I think they're a reputable uh, source of information. Sometimes they come up with conclusions I like, sometimes not, but they come up with the facts, and then we can draw the conclusions. I want the science reviewed, and then we can let the appropriate policymakers reach the conclusion. But uh, Ms. Watson. I, Ms. Watson's been very nice. Yes. Uh, tolerant. I came in late, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, I would like to know what we are investigating and uh, looking at in this particular meeting. Now, reading from the information that was given to us, it says RU486, demonstrating a low standard for women's health. Uh, may I ask, uh, I would uh, maybe ask Dr. Rarick, or Dr. Harrison, the question, let me start with Dr. Herrick. Are we talking about a low standard for women's health, and if so, what is that? And are you agreeing that uh, we've seen more women die after using this drug than women who die after having abortions? I, I just want to focus this discussion. I think we've gotten off a of track. So uh, can you respond to that? Because we're looking at a low standard for women's health. At least that's what I thought this meeting was about, not our uh, beliefs and uh, what sides we're taking. So can you answer that question, the low standard question? Certainly. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, Mifepristone in its review at the FDA was held to the highest standards similar to any drug product that's reviewed in the Center for Drugs. It was reviewed in a rigorous way. It took over four years from its submission to its approval. It was appropriately labeled. It was held to the, the highest standards uh, for women's or men's health um, at the FDA, and I believe they're still treating it that way. They're looking at the issues that you're asking about. Are there more deaths? reported with mifepristone and with surgical abortion. Some would say that there's tenfold more deaths, I think we just heard that, um, reported. But again, we have to think about how they're looking at this data. Is there a way to get more accurate data on surgical abortions, et cetera? Is there a way to understand the mifepristone-associated deaths so that they can be prevented? Is the, if the issue is risk and benefit, they're looking at that very seriously, and I think it's being held to the appropriate and high standard. Uh, as the Department of Government that looks at drugs and their usage and results, what would be the next step if you then conclude that there appears to be a higher number of deaths associated with the approval and the use of this particular drug? What's the next step? Well, the next steps would be to look into those types of deaths in all pregnancy-related events to try to understand those better, make pr providers aware of those infections and that potential, understand how to prevent it, understand how to treat it, uh, do with women the service of understanding pregnancy-related deaths in the broader sense, not just when, when related to mifepristone. Many more women die from childbirth than die from using mifepristone and for medical abortion putting money into those questions, surveillance into maternal mortality, appropriate money to explore maternal mortality in its broader sense, those would be the next steps. Do, should the FDA look at all this information? 
absolutely. They, as I've said before, they have all the information and more than Dr. Harrison has referred to. They're looking at it very seriously. If they, be, if they believe, they, they, they come to the conclusion that the risks do not outweigh the benefits, they, they'll take appropriate action. Okay, and do you feel that we are demonstrating a lower standard for women's health? Not at all. All right. Uh, I would hope that this committee would uh, provide the oversight as FDA moves along, and uh, we would then look at the empirical evidence that would emanate from your studies to address this question. Uh, if we are demonstrating a lower standard, then provide the scientific evidence, and uh, I would beg that we don't discuss the A word in terms of looking at this particular drug. Uh, it gets us off track, as it did just about a minute ago. What I want to be presented with as a decision maker is what evidence we might have that we have approved a drug that lowers the standards for women. Thank you. I, yes, I will, certainly. Well, I wasn't even aware of it until you just pointed out uh, the chairman said it depends on how you ask the question, but the hearing, no, the hearing uh, is, is titled for today, Are You 486 Demonstrating a Low Standard for Women's Health? Question mark. So that's the way we're asking the question. And uh, I think we need to see whether there's a, a pro uh, and you answered that question and I was pleased with your answer, but I think the question should be, is there a connection between uh, Mr. Patterson's daughter and, and the five people that have died from this particular infection and the use of RU486, that seems to me the key to it because if there's a connection with the use of this drug and getting something as deadly as this infection, that's a serious matter. So we need to explore it, but evidently it's not so clear when we find people have had the infection who didn't have the drug. and. Uh, so I, 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 uh, I, I agree with you. Let's get the science. Let's get the facts. Dr. Eric, I, I was a, a little confused by your response. Um, you said that if, in fact, there were deaths, you would work for uh, or believe there should be further uh, notification to doctors. And I inserted this earlier, but Paladone, Purdue Pharma agreed to voluntarily suspend and they said, to date, FDA is not aware of any patients who had life-threatening side effects from drinking alcohol while taking Paladone, but they took it off the market. And uh, T-Y-S-A-B-R-I, Sabri, uh, Biogen voluntarily suspended marketing of the drug as well as its use in clinical trials until more detailed information could be gathered on one death and one other adverse effect. A neutral spec. Palatin Technologies voluntarily suspended sales and marketing of Nutrospec. No determinative determination was made regarding the relationship between that and reported adverse effects. In Silert, uh, Abbott chose to stop sales and marketing based on 13 reports of liver failure, uh, but they did not uh, grant, uh, let's see, 10, and RU486 had 10 to 14 times more than surgical abortion, uh, even though in this case liver failure was 10 to 25 greater uh, in the general population. Bextra, Pfizer voluntarily withdrew Bextra from the market, uh, e e even though it concluded that the overall risk versus benefit was unfavorable. That uh, there were, uh, in Baycall, they withdrew after reports of 31 deaths. In Raplin, it was five deaths. In Lotronix, uh, it was a total of 70 cases of adverse effects, of which 34 required hospitalization without surgery, and it was pulled off. Uh, in uh, Orlam, it was discontinued after report of severe cardiac-related events among opiate-addicted patients. They pull it off the market, not just warnings. So is your position that FDA should treat this drug other than other, unlike other drugs? Because when there are adverse effects with deaths and so on, at the very least you would think it would be suspended. Um, that, that's been the whole pattern. The problem here is you've got a drug company that only has one drug, it's in the Cayman Islands. It has no incentive to do what all these other companies did, which went off the market. And so what is the responsibility of the federal government when the private sector won't act responsibly like the others? Now, and I happen to believe, even though I don't want RU486 on the market, that there may be some debate here 
as to whether it's the primary. And that's why I was asking questions of, can it be suspended while we find that out? But I see no pattern out of FDA that we leave something on the market while we're doing that study, because it is clear that it was toxic in a disproportionate amount if you're using RU486, that the blood transfusions were certainly disproportionate. And under any standard of the past, you'd at least suspend, hence the question of the hearing. Oh, I would simply disagree with you. You can list all the ones that have been suspended, but you have to think of the thousands of drugs that are on the market that have post-marketing reports of deaths. Easiest example is Viagra, where we had at least several hundred deaths during its first year of uh, prescription. Same company, Pfizer, that you mentioned there for Bextra. There's all kinds of examples of post-marketing death adverse event reports and other serious adverse event reports where the majority are certainly not suspended for marketing. Even if it was directly related to that product, FDA does, uh, on what, then what standard would you have FDA intervene? The standard that they use, which is a risk-benefit analysis for each particular case. Mr. Sneed, what's your response to that? <coughs> um, I, th I think that, that essentially that that's exactly right, namely that it is a risk-benefit analysis that's undertaken to determine whether or not a drug is initially approved. But I'd like to add something that I think uh, is, would be informative to, to the members. What we're talking about here is, as a legal matter, is a drug that has been approved under subpart H. And what that means, that creates an inference that the FDA, in approving uh, mifepristone, had a concern, safety concerns, that required additional safeguards beyond the normal safeguards that attend a normal risk-benefit risk analysis. And the, in the passage that I read before from the FDA's final rule, they said, the risk-benefit analysis that yields the conclusion that this should be approved assumes that these post-marketing requirements will A, be effective, and B, be observed. So th there's been much discussion about the safety piece of that particular question, but what seems to be getting lost among the discussion is there's a second question, a second grounds under subpart H, which is a factual question about the compliance with the, with the post-marketing restrictions by Danko uh, Corporation. And so I, I, would, I would just draw the, the committee's attention back to the fact that, of course, safety is a, a principal concern as laid out in the, in the withdrawal approvals of subpart H as well as with the other withdrawal approvals that I take up in my written testimony. But the question of compliance is equally important uh, of a question because without meaningful compliance by Danko, the risk-benefit analysis is not what the FDA intended it to be. The risk-benefit analysis depends on the assumption that there is compliance. And if there's no compliance, then the risk-benefit analysis is substantially different. Mr. Chairman, could, could you tell me, yield to me? Yes. For, do you have evidence of noncompliance? I have no evidence of any kind. I'm just simply describing to you what the considerations so are. So you're saying if there hadn't been compliance of the limitations? Statement. I'm making a conditional statement. If the FDA were to determine that there was no compliance, then they would have right. additional grounds to withdraw approval. But I hadn't heard anybody H. assert that there hadn't been compliance of, uh, the, of the approval itself under the subpart H. And of course, this is unusual because most drugs are just approved. And once they're approved, they can be used for any purpose. This one was approved for limited purposes under limited circumstances so that there would be extra care taken. Uh, I, I, I guess that I, I should ask that question of Dr. Rarick. Is that, am I correct in that? It wasn't. Correct. Approved like most other drugs, go ahead and use it. There was a determination that it shouldn't be released through pharmacies, that it had to be provided by specific types of prescribers. Okay. And, and, uh, and I should say for the record that we did invite Danko so we could address that question, and they withdrew two days before the hearing, and we didn't have a chance to get somebody else to directly address the question. But it's a fair question. I mean, I understood. It's not a fair question unless you know there's no, some No, no, no. I mean, your question is a fair question. Oh because we don't know for sure about compliance. I, I tried to address that with the FDA. I don't think personally that the, the, what was tested has been followed through the way it was tested, but the commi assistant commissioner explained why she allowable, but we don't have Danko here, and we don't have a substitute for Danko to follow through that question, but it's a question we need to follow up in our, our written questions, and we said at the beginning that I was going to do that with, with Danko. And Dr. Harrison, um, could you talk about the proportionate use uh, effect, too, of Viagra is used over and over, uh, RU486 would not be, uh, and any comments you had on, on Dr. Rarick saying, look, there are other drugs we allow on, on market, because that's a fair point. If there's lots of drugs on the market that have uh, adverse effects, why should this be treated differently than those? The issue, the issue isn't an absolute number of adverse events, as the F. Yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah, the issue is not the absolute number of adverse events. 
The issue is, as is stated in the FDA letter to this committee, um, the evidence, whether or not RU486 caused, was causally related to the adverse event, the timing of the event. Remember that these RU46 septic deaths happened within seven days. There's no issue of confounding factors here. There, these women were healthy. They didn't have other medical conditions that could explain why they would suddenly get an extremely rare bacterial infection that doesn't usually kill normally uh, immunocompetent people. How severe these events are, the death is the ultimate severe adverse event. Um, and I would have to add that transfusions are also a significant severe adverse event. And to, uh, to minimize the significance of having a blood transfusion is uh, to underestimate um, the, the care that goes into clinically judging whether or not this person needs a, a transfusion. Transfusions aren't done lightly. They're done when there's a significant risk to the person's life. Can the adverse events be predicted or, over, or avoided? The uh, CDC meeting was absolutely clear that at this point in time, there is no way to predict who is going to get the C who is going to die from C. sordelli. And because we can't predict who and we can't identify risk factors, we also can't avoid C. sordelli in mifepristone abortions. There's, there has been a consistent spontaneous, uh, a consistent rate, excuse me, of about one death for every 100,000 um, uh, mifepristone uses. So if that continues unabated while we debate these questions of, you know, how much research and who gets the grant money and all that stuff, that means that for every thousand uses of mifepristone, we, th one more American woman's going to die. And I think that's something that has to be put into perspective. These are human beings that are being subjected to a completely unnecessary risk. Surgical abortion is available and legal and safer. And, um, how safe is the alternative treatment? And, and that's the other issue. Surgical abortion is available. It's legal. And to say that mifepristone is being used in cases where surgical abortion isn't available, think about what, have, what would have happened to these transfusion deaths if there hadn't been surgical abortion available. Okay, any place that has uh, the capability to, uh, excuse me, any place that doesn't have the capability to have an abortion clinic also doesn't have the capability to uh, do transfusion. We're talking pretty sophisticated medical facilities. And so you, the, the person you absolutely do not want to use mifepristone is the one who has no access to surgical uh, facilities to complete this under an emergency circumstance. So I think that's kind of a spurious argument. Um, so that would be my response. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, may I, may I please? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Cummings. I have sat here and I've listened to all of this. And I was sitting here saying to myself, I'm so glad that um, there are women making these arguments. I'd hate to see a, m a group of men, they would probably, uh, maybe folk would probably say that we were not as sensitive as we need to be. But, and I say that to say this, that I think we're all concerned about women's health. As a matter of fact, I know we are. And I don't think that in this country we're talking about low standards. Let's not kid ourselves. This is the United States of America. And I, and I would, I, there's no way that I think any member of this panel uh, would um, in any way accept a low standard or even a mediocre standard. And the witnesses, I know you feel the same way. We may differ, you may differ on your opinions and what have you. The key is, uh, uh, Mr. Patterson, is we want to make sure that we do everything in our power, as I know you want us to do, to make sure this does not happen to anyone else. That's what this is all about. And I would hope and I would think that you, Dr. Eric, when you, I asked you the question a little earlier, because I really wanted to get a sense of exactly, uh, obviously there's a procedure that you have there at uh, FDA, and obviously I, th you know, you can tell me if I'm wrong, you try to, you try to keep the politics out of it, because you're talking about people living and dying, I guess, and I trust that you do, and but you've heard you've heard the testimony of Dr. Harrison, and I mean, and I would assume that you would, as we all are, are sensitive to women's health. And 
is there anything here that, I mean, is there anything that you have heard that you um, would question whether you all have a low standard? I know that may be a sort of self-serving question. I'm not trying to do that. But I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of this because, you know, sometimes we can get so caught up in our politics that we forget where we're trying to get to and we get sort of off track. And the key is, is that we want to make sure, all of us, that FDA has a standard which will protect every woman with regard to her health choices. And that, so that leads me to this. Somebody said a few minutes ago, I think it was you, Ms. Patterson, it was you. When you were talking about your daughter, you said if, 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 the, if there was information, if she had access to all the information, uh, she probably would not have made that choice. Now, I'm asking you, based upon all that you know, Dr. Eric, is there anything that you could have, or the FDA could have put on the label or put on the, the little uh, description of the drugs, side effects, whatever, that should have been there? I mean, just based upon what you know to the state, I'm not talking about, I know there's still research to be done and all that kind of stuff, that should have been on there. Well, I would stand behind the FDA's labeling at each point when they revise their labeling. And if you look at the current labeling, it does describe that there have been some unusual and severe bacterial infections and death. It describes some of the way the regimen was given in those cases. It provides that information. I agree with you that the FDA has to look at this very seriously and always dis decide, is do the benefits m remain to outweigh the risks? If you ask me about high standards, I would say the FDA holds this to a, a very high standard. I, I believe if you are looking for low standards in women's health, it would be that we don't have very much information about maternal mortality in general, not just post-abortal or post-medical abortion mortality, <coughs> but just infections and, and pregnancy outcomes in any events in general. But in terms of mifepristone being held to a particularly low standard, absolutely not. Held to a, a, the highest standards, uh, I think the FDA has, is considered the most rigorous regulatory body in the, in the world. And it, of course, meets those needs. I agree with you that these things are incredibly serious. Nobody is trying to uh, minimalize any of these events. Uh, I believe the FDA is looking at this from their scientific viewpoint. Uh, a, at the meeting at last week, I think we're quoted as saying they initially saw this as a simple, probably a simple drug-based association, and they realized when they looked into it that simply wasn't true, that it was much more complicated than just mifepristone and infection, and they're looking at it. Now, you said the label, the labeling has changed. I'm going to get back to you, Ms. Patterson, one second. I, I see you shaking your head. But you said the labeling has changed. Is that right? Yeah, the labeling has been updated, I think, at least three times since its original approval. And I take it that when uh, Mr. Patterson's daughter took the, th there, have been, there have been changes since Mr. Patterson's daughter used this medication? Yes. Um, maybe one of you all could tell us what, were those the changes that you just talked about? You said something, I mean, what, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, have, have we made much progress with regard to going back to what you said, Mr. Patterson, putting it out there, as much information that we, that, as possible, that we feel comfortable is accurate? Well, first of all, I'd like to say again that if Holly had all the information to make an informed choice, she wouldn't have chosen mifepristone or an RU-46 medical abortion. There is evidence in, uh, that a death did occur in Canada uh, with an infection, and she, in fact, did die from C. cerdelii, and that was what I uncovered in my medical research that was not very well known or very well published. As a matter of fact, the, the author of the paper of the woman who died in Canada was Dr. Christian Senave. Just so happens that I was, uh, at the time, uh, my wife and I, when we called Dr. Senave, he was, we were the very first uh, person or, you know, concerned people to call about that particular infection as it's associated with RU-46. He said in his own words that uh, he had been discouraged to write the paper and that uh, we were like the only ones that had ever showed any interest and since then there has been a, a, a considerable interest over this infection and its relationship with the drug. To say that this drug, there is no causal relationship, I think is ridiculous. My daughter took the drug and she died. I mean, it's v that's simple. So it, the, the medical community was aware of it. Danco was aware of it. 
the Population Council was aware of it, and there were studies showing that there were infections as a result of, of medical abortion. However, Holly, it was not indicated in the label, and Holly was not given that information. Since, the, since my daughter died, I've been to Washington. I've discussed my concerns with the FDA over these safety and health concerns. Uh, there have been, consequently, there have been four more women died after Holly, uh, and some very shortly, within months after Holly. And it, as a matter of fact, with the reporting aspects, it took one of the deaths right after Holly, it took over almost a year and a half to get reported. And I have also, that's why today I have discussed there needs to be some very accurate uh, mechanisms to be able to evaluate uh, from the FDA's level what is really going on out there and I am very concerned that women are dying and these events are not getting reported so that the FDA can actually do their job. All right, All right so there have been and thank you very much and I didn't know just the last question there have been some updates with regard to the the warnings is that right? Correct. And um, I think November, in November 2004, the black box warning was revised and strengthened to add new information on the risk of serious bacterial infections, sepsis, bleeding, and death that may occur following any termination of pregnancy, including uh, meth 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 Mephoprex. In July 2005, apparently the FDA approved a labeling supplement to again strengthen the black box warning. Uh, on the product by noting that in atypical presentations of serious infection can occur without fever, bacteria, or significant findings on pelvic exam, et cetera. Is that accurate? That's my, my review of the label, I believe, would agree with that. I, uh, can, I don't have the label here if you want to see the whole label. No, no problem. I just wanted to make sure that it uh, is being updated. Do you have anything else, Mr. Waxman? This issue of uh, death associated with a drug, when, when FDA um, approves drugs, they, they look at the safety and they look at the efficacy, whether the drug accomplishes what it's intended to accomplish. Aren't there risks associated with a lot of drugs, uh, Dr. Rarick? Oh, every drug has risks associated with it, yes. Viagra could cause death. Penicillin can cause death. They're on the market, but I assume they're on the market because there's a risk-benefit analysis that even though there may be a rare case of death, it's not so out of control that, uh, that, uh, that it diminishes the fact that there's a, a benefit from those drugs. Is that what we mean by a risk-benefit analysis? Correct. That you look at those risks, those death reports and rates, in, in, concept, um, in contrast to the benefits. And there's a question in my mind about deaths or, or harm associated with the drug as opposed to death or harm caused by the drug. Can you clarify what that means in terms of FDA regulation? Sounds like a legal term, but uh, <laughs> I'll try. When you think of cause and causation, you think you know, if, if I tell my kid, don't touch the hot stove, you're going to get burned. And he touches the hot stove, he gets burned. To me, that's cause and effect. When you look at drugs and the risks associated with them, it's very rare that you can actually say X drug causes Y, because as you know, many, many people take the drugs that don't get that effect. Uh, in, in the majority of pe people who take a particular drug won't have the side effects that are described in the label, but there are going to be side effects in, in many people. And there you would call that um, a side effect that's associated with the use of that product. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Patterson pointed out, I think, appropriately that um, he wished his daughter would have known that there was this potential side effect. Mm -hmm. Now, FDA has issued public health advisories in connection with safety concerns related to mefepristone in 2004, 2005, and most recently in March 2006. The FDA has consistently highlighted the fact that the cases of severe infection occurred with regimens of mefepristone and misoprostol that were not in approved labeling, although the relationship of the infections to such use remains unknown. What does that mean? They've said that there, could you tell us more about this if you that, know? That means even though the products are being used outside of their labeled instructions, the FDA wants to make sure that providers and patients are aware that 
that it has been associated with these infections. Whether it would be associated with those infections if it had been used as per label, they're not stating. They're simply saying that they could, they could just say, well, that wasn't used by the label. We don't even need to put it on the label. But instead, they're saying, no, we need to make sure providers and patients are aware that in certain circumstances we've had these reports. They're not suggesting that it's absolutely that circumstance that was this, that caused the increased risk, but they, are, they want to make sure that information is available. Well, I, I thank you for that clarification, and I will conclude by saying I, I just hope the FDA will continue to reevaluate all the evidence, advise people of information that uh, is pertinent, and if they see there's a, a real threat to this drug or any other drug, they need to take actions, including taking the drug off the market. But I don't think they ought to act until they looked at the science and reached some conclusions on this drug or any other drug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and rather than um, uh, uh, ask Dr. Harrison the question again, I think we'll insert in the record your earlier response on the ca causal link that there were multiple things, including alternatives such as surgical abortions and so on, because you gave a complex answer to that question early on. Did you have anything you want to add? No, that's fine. Uh, Ms. Watson? I just hope that uh, we can have, uh, Mr. Chairman, a follow-up hearing as FDA proceeds along its track to assess the risk of this drug, that we will do the oversight that we are responsible for here in Congress. And I would hope that uh, we would base our debate on the results of your studies so that we can come from a scientific base as we discuss this. And so I want to thank the chair for this hearing. I think it's opened up uh, a debate on the efficacy of this drug that's been approved, and we need to see uh, what the effects actually are. So thank you so much for the hearing, and thank uh, to the panel. Thank you, and I want to thank each of the witnesses, and I want to say this uh, directly to Dr. Wood and Dr. Rarick, whether we agree on the nuances here or maybe we do long term or not that your work long term on uh, Dr. Wood particularly, but also Dr. Rarick on women's health issues because certainly it was an area that was underrepresented in the research and that uh, uh, without aggressive advocacy, we wouldn't be where we are on breast cancer on the whole range of women's health issues. So regardless of where we stand on this issue, uh, I appreciate your lengthy career working with that, uh, Dr. Rarick uh, as well, and thank uh, Mr. Patterson for speaking out, for Dr. Harrison for giving us that detailed analysis uh, of each of the type of cases in your uh, rigorous analysis of that, and Mr. Sneed for bringing the, the legal aspects in, and we'll find out particularly if Danko responds, uh, how to address uh, some of their questions legally on whether they, they've been uh, following through on the guidelines of FDA. With that, uh, the subcommittee stands adjourned. In a moment, debate from the Senate floor on the immigration bill. 